Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim and I'd like to welcome everybody to our illustrious College of Complexes format tonight. The format of the college consists of the following. One is that our, we'll have a brief announcements period. Two, our speaker will then um, uh, speak up to about an hour. After that, we'll have our illustrious questions and answers period where, again, we encourage you to ask questions and not make political statements because you'll have a plenty of chance to do that in our rebuttal period. We generally finish up about nine o'clock, but we'll keep the Zoom call open for anybody who wants to talk afterwards like we've normally been doing and sometimes gone till midnight, but that's another story. Um, if you're ready, Charlie, uh, I will now entertain announcements to the, uh, for the good of the college and anybody else who's got something to uh, enlighten us tonight as far as uh, upcoming events is concerned. All right, welcome everyone to meeting number 3,638 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Okay, first of all, uh, we have, as usual, uh, I want to mention we have a special Google group that you can sign up and join to get updated information on the program and the upcoming Saturday and the meetup group, which uh, functions in the same fashion that's restricted to one or two emails per week, one at the beginning and end of the week. So I highly recommend that you sign up for either one of those uh, to get an alert of our schedule. And although I am not a capitalist, what about our Facebook I will page, give an Charlie? advertisement. What? For our, we also have a Facebook page too as well that you can also uh, look at for upcoming yes. events as well. Okay, um, yes, Facebook we'll page back, as well. We'll go back and, uh, and get in here. The, uh, which you can join, that's a good idea. Okay, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. Next week, October the 23rd, Jim Fetzer, who uh, is something of a conspiracy expert uh, on a variety of conspiracies. Uh, but he's going to talk about, in, uh, give a presentation on the COVID conspiracy. So see you next Saturday uh, if you got issues regarding uh, COVID and the, pan the alleged pandemic. All right. Following that on October 30th, we're going to have an Illinois Green Party candidate for the United States Congress, Adam Broad, uh, will be speaking. He has speak spoken previously at the college. He gave a very, very interesting presentation on single payer health care. So, uh, and he's a bit of an activist, uh, gets around. So, that should be an interesting program. Following that, um, November 6th. Let's see. What do we got on the 6th? Oh, uh, Marsha Williams. For, uh, another candidate for Congress, Marsha Williams. And she is an advocate of universal health care, the Green New Deal, which everybody should be for. And listen to this criminal justice reform. So maybe our speaker will uh, tune into that. Anyhow, Marsh will be there. On November the 13th, uh, the uh, nonviolence, the anti-nuclear people, a well-established group, Pache Abene, nonviolent service they offer. Uh, so military issues will be the topic the military budget on November the 13th. On November the 20th, a group has not spoken to the college, the Coalition for the Infrastructure. They want to fund it through a bank. Uh, there's various ways of doing this. I'm familiar with this, uh, funding for transit and trains. But um, they have put together a coalition to, uh, this is in the news, uh, with the, inf the infrastructure issue before Congress. On November the 27th, she's here tonight, uh, but Jan Lee 
is going to be talking about race, racial ideas, and racism. And she maintains that our, our concept of race uh, that we hold is outdated, outdated. So if you are holding outdated views on race, I'd recommend attending that program. Let's see, the next one is... Um, December 4th. December 4th. This is a big, these are big shots in the eco world. Uh, the Illinois Environmental Council will come and talk about Illinois issues, environmental issues. They put together a scorecard and I've done these. This is an awful lot of work, but you get to see what the issues are ecologically in across the state of Illinois, such as shutting down all the nuclear reactors sure. that endanger the lives of the people, uh, stuff like that. They're not funding their operation. Okay. Uh, December the 18th is open. Uh, it's the next open date if you would like to speak or you have not spoken to the college or know someone we should invite, please let me know. Yeah, In addition I... to that, uh, well, okay, December the 18th. And um, wait a minute, we left out one. I haven't posted this yet. On December the 11th, I just booked them yesterday. December the 11th, where our speaker will be the Center for Pluralism. And his, his topic will be talking with difficult people. Yeah, I know. Or cleaning your slate and living in peace. So if you want to get know how to talk to difficult people, which I know how to do already. <laughs> yeah. I'm an expert at that. By being but, difficult. <laughs> But he, I just added that, and he's a, quite a figure. He's gotten around. He's been on the media, television shows, and so forth. So he's got a thing about uh, um, talking with difficult people. All right. After that, the next open dates. We have four dates open in uh, January. In January, if you'd like to get on the speed. The four dates in January are open, 8, 15, 22, 29. And that's it. Thank you very much, Tim. Take it away. Okay. Before we go anywhere else, I just also want to tell you that we do have a uh, Dallas campus that meets on Thursday nights. It's on a similar format. Um, we They do have a list of speakers and their next speaker on October 21st is China's looming threat. Taiwan is the next domino. Then, of course, Thursday, October 28th, they are open. And uh, with that, I'm going to stop the share and open it up for anybody else who may have an announcement for the good of the college here real quick. Um, and if, if anybody else does not have an announcement, we can start our main speaker. I know Margaret's in. Do you have any announcements, Margaret, you'd like to convey to us real quick? Okay. All right, Thomas, again, well, while the speaker is speaking, I'm going to ask that all of you mute so we can hear him clearly. And uh, if you guys uh, are ready, Thomas, uh, take it away and the uh, format and forum is yours. Thank you, Tim. <clears throat> and thanks, everyone, for, uh, for attending and thanks for having me. Um, my topic today is I'm going to talk about frauds and scams that target the elderly. And I'm going to talk about some COVID scams. I'm going to talk about that have been occurring and are still occurring, and I'm going to talk about other scams as well. So I, I've mixed in a bunch of material uh, as it relates to that. I'm going to share my screen here, and I'm going to uh, open up my PowerPoint presentation. So give me a second. I would uh, ask that if you have questions, if you could hold them uh, till the end. I'm uh, I'm happy to. Uh, to answer any questions you may have. Uh, let's see. Okay, and we'll start off here. So um, a little bit about myself. Um, the, I'm right now I'm the Associate Dean of the Public Services Division at the College of DuPage. I'm also the Director of the Homeland Security Training Institute at the college. 
I was with the United States Postal Inspectors for 26 years. So I've, I've worked a lot. I've spent a lot of years of my life uh, protecting seniors against frauds and scams. Um, I had my own radio show for a while called uh, Don't Fall For It, which was a live show that was on every week. And I talked about a different fraud or scam every week. So I put a lot of, um, of myself into, into this topic. It's something that's very important to me. And uh, one of my favorite things is uh, uh, putting people that defraud seniors um, in jail. And a little bit about my career with the Postal Inspection Service. I was the inspector in charge of the Washington Division. And I was the lead executive during the anthrax investigation. If you remember in early uh, 2000 and 2001, after 9-11, there was a uh, anthrax attacks through the mail. And I was the lead executive on that. I was in Washington, I was the inspector in charge. And uh, that was a, a terrorist attack that killed five people. I was also a deputy chief inspector for our Western field operations. I was the inspector in charge of the uh, Chicago division the last seven years of my career. And uh, I was the lead executive on the uh, uh, former governor Rob Blagojevich case um, during that time. I have a bachelor's degree in psychology and I have a master's degree in Homeland Security Management from Towson University. Uh, I was born and raised and grew up in Chicago. So um, it's nice to talk to this group, uh, especially and in, in, in folks that are from the same town that, uh, that I grew up in. I moved around the country a lot and I investigate. I, I was an investigator for my, the first six years of my federal career. And then I went to management and I was an uh, executive for 15 years with that organization. But I'm really passionate about protecting seniors against frauds and scams. There's so many of them out there. Uh, frauds and scams have been around since the Civil War days. And in 1872, the, 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 uh, uh, the mail fraud statute was enacted by the government. And that was really to, uh, to stop these frauds and scams that were happening. And really, I, I point back to the Civil War, because that's about the time that um, 1872 is, is when the federal statute was enacted for mail fraud. So it goes back a long way. I like to talk about the psych psychological aspect of, uh, of, of fraud and scams. And in my experience, and again, a lot of what I'm talking about is based upon my experience um, and things I've seen, people I've seen victimized. And uh, there's two reasons why people fall for scams. One is greed, and that's when people feel that there's an investment that appeals to someone's need for a quick reward. And this goes back to if it sounds too good to be true, it usually is. That, that's 100% true. And if your gut tells you that there's something that's uh, not right or a fraud or scam, it, you, your, your, your gut is generally going to be right. What? But sometimes people want to... They, they, they think I saved the base because it had those tanks on <laughs> They think that there's an easy way to, uh, to, to, to get rich um, and, and that doesn't happen. So it's generally greed gets involved when someone falls for a scam. The other one is emotional. Um, if there's a, a scam that impacts something related to someone's family, like the grandparent scam, which I'm gonna talk about in this presentation, it ties an emotion. And if there's emotion tied to a scam, there's a 99.9% .9 chance that that scam is going to be effective for the scammer. Um, I've done a lot of time studying how scammers think and how they act, and they want to try to tie any motion to a scam. That, that's a, a, a good way for them to become successful in their scam. Um, if you remember our Operation Varsity Blues, that was where uh, wealthy people were, were paying to get their children into colleges throughout the country. That's one that contains both, both greed and emotion, because they're trying to, a lot of these were parents trying to do something for their children um, and, and using their financial um, ability to do that. Um, so it was greedy. They wanted to get their children into the best colleges in the country. So they tried to pay their way in. So that's one that's a little bit of both. But these are the two psychological aspects that relate to a fraud either being successful or not successful. These two things are, are, are what I've seen um, in, in the success or non-success of, of a fraud or scam. 
So let's talk a little bit about elder fraud. Seniors age 60 and older account for about 15% of the population in the United States. So there's a lot of seniors in the United States. Scammers will target seniors specifically um, because there's a lot of people that they can try to scam. That's, that's very important as it relates to uh, these scammers. According to some estimates, seniors compri comprise 30% of fraud victims. It's a large percentage of people that fall victims of fraud and scams are seniors. And I've talked to seniors that have lost their life savings to scams. Um, I mean, I've talked face to face to them and nothing bothers me more than when a scammer takes someone's financial nest egg away from them. So I've dedicated a good portion of my life to putting these people in prison. Um, and also to spending a lot of time talking about this and educating people so that they don't become a victim of a scam. So wh why are seniors targeted? I mean, why are scammers looking at, at seniors? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Seniors can be more vulnerable. They could be, uh, they could be alone. They could not have a family. Um, they can be more vulnerable and they don't have people to ask questions to about these scams. So they don't know if it's, if it's a scam or not. And they can tend to become a victim uh, because of their, of their vulnerability. Uh, some seniors are very trusting. And, you know, and, and it's true, it's a different generation. Um, they, they, they're more trusting, they can, uh, it's hard for them to hang up the phone on someone, you know, because they, they think they're gonna be rude. What I say in this presentation is be rude, be rude as hell, because scammers are gonna really just try to take your money. So feel free to, to hang up the phone, feel free to delete an email that doesn't look right. That way you won't fall victim to a scam. Older people may believe the pitches that they hear. You know, they, they may be hearing something on television and it may ring a bell in, in, in their mind where they think that that's true. So they, they could believe them. And again, if they don't have people that they can go to and ask questions or a resource such as a, a let's say a, a postal inspector and say, hey, is this legitimate or not? Um, then they may fall victim to a, to a scam. Seniors may have trouble spotting fraud. You know, the scammers that are out there are really, really good at what they do. They really try to make these things look legitimate. And it's hard. I mean, it's hard for people that aren't seniors, too, to determine if something's a fraud or a scam. Older victims find it difficult to end unwanted telemarketing calls. This is one that I've seen over and over again, that a senior um, does not want to hang up on someone. And the easiest way to, to end a call is to hang up on someone or don't take the call at all and let it go to voicemail. And uh, what, we tell, what we tell seniors is you have the power not to become a victim. You have the power. And we want them to feel empowered so they can say, you know, hey, sorry, and click, hang up the phone or delete that email. They, we want to empower them to feel that they can do this themselves. Because if they can, and they do, they, the chances of them becoming a victim get much less. Seniors are often reluctant to seek advice about financial matters. Why is that? Well, because sometimes they're embarrassed. They don't want to talk to their family about financial matters. They don't want to tell people that they've become a victim. Oftentimes, our seniors become a victim of a fraud. They don't even report it. They won't report it. We know if there's more fraud out there that has not been reported, and that's because seniors are, um, are embarrassed by it. But we tell them, get over that. You know, you got to let people know. You got to let the police know if you've been scammed. Talk about sucker lists. These are real things. A sucker list is a, a, a list, list of names of people that have been um, taken advantage of by a scammer. And scammers will share these names. And we call it a sucker list in, in law enforcement. Um, if you often respond to sweepstakes contests, and there are people out there that respond to hundreds of sweepstakes contests all the time. Your name might be added to a list sold to con artists. They, they, they try to sell these to each other so that they can have more victims or, or more people that are potential, more potential victims because they've fallen victim to a scam in the past. A sucker list contains the names of people who have been or are good candidates, as I said, victims of fraud. People on the list may hear from crooks who claim they can help them recover 
for a fee, money lost to a con artist. So now you got scammers that are trying to scam someone who's already been scammed by saying, I can help you get your money back from that scammer. So it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a real business. It's a real, uh, um, it's, it's a blight to the country. And it's certainly something that we don't want anyone to become a victim of. And especially from my perspective, especially seniors. So I'm talking a little bit about COVID-19 vaccine scams. Um, and, and again, I think most people are aware of this by now that va vaccines are free for all Americans. When, when the pandemic started, there were people that were saying that I can, we can get you a, a vaccine and, and charging people, trying to charge people for a vaccine. Um, now people know that you don't have to pay a dime for a vaccine or vaccination. Um, if you're being asked for money for a vaccine, you can be sure someone's trying to cheat you. And again, this was the beginning of the pandemic, but now you know we're gonna see the same thing when booster shots start being administered. Because anytime there's something new, scammers try to take advantage of that. So I guarantee you that's the next thing that people have to watch out for. Um, or someone may say they may uh, tell you to pay to be added to a waiting list um, or offer to undergo additional testing or procedures when obtaining the vaccine and paying for those. That's all, that's all a scam, 100% scam. So it's something to, to certainly be cognizant of because it's gonna continue. As long as the pandemic is continuing, these COVID-19 scams will continue. One of the things we talk about is do not display your vaccine card on social media. I've talked to seniors a lot, and this is not only seniors, this is people who have been vaccinated and they're, they're, they're excited about getting their vaccination. So they take a picture of it um, and put it on Facebook. There's personal identifier information on that card. Your birth date is on there. Um, and it may, there may contain other information. Um, and that could lead you to become a victim of identity theft. We've, we've seen scammers try to use some of this material um, to, to uh, open up credit, to purchase uh, um, things from stores and in, in, in individuals' names. So the date of birth can be used um, and the name of the person is on there as well. So you're, 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 you're showing some valuable information and it sounds like it's, it's something that's simple, but sometimes people don't, don't think twice about it. Okay. So, so your name, your date of birth. Talk a little bit about some charity scams. Whenever there's a disaster or, or something, we you know we, the, the pandemic that we're facing, um, anytime there's a disaster, charity scams will follow. Charity scams will follow in droves. I don't care if it's a, a, a natural disaster, uh, um, a, a hurricane, right. a, uh, a, a tornado, anything like that, uh, you, you may, you'll see people uh, putting up fake charities or fake charities trying to get money from people. So I like to talk about charity scams. Charity scams are com common regardless of what's happening in the news, but fraudsters follow the headlines and coronavirus is a prime way for them to claim that they're gathering donations for families that have been affected by the virus or the economic fallout. They, there's always an angle Scammers are always looking for an angle. So if, if, if there's a, a way where they can get money from people, um, and you know, people like to give, people like to give money to other people that are in need. There's nothing wrong with that. And that's a really, a really important thing to do. But scammers know that. <clears throat> so they know that people can be vulnerable to give away money when there's a, a disaster, or as we're going through right now, a, a, a pandemic. Like, for example, sometimes charities scams sound very much like a real scam. And that's what scammers will do. They'll try to make the charity, <coughs> excuse me, sound like a, a legitimate charity. So this was one, the Police Survivors Fund. This was one that happened in Michigan. And the aim of the Police Survivors Fund was to aid widows and children of police killed on the job. It was established in 1999 and disbanded by 2003 when its founder pleaded guilty to various fraud charges. This was nothing but a scam, but it sounded like it sounded legitimate. So it would draw people in and that's what it did. And of course the person was uh, uh, arrested and convicted on fraud charges when it was found that it was just a, a bogus. So these are out there, you know, you can look them up on the internet, uh, charity scam names that relate to, um, legitimate charities. It sounds, it could sound the same as legitimate charity, but you got to do your research. 
So if you're going to offer money or donate money to a charity, do your research. Do your own research. Um, look into the charity. Make sure that it's legitimate. Make sure your money is going to where you want it to go if you decide to donate. Sometimes people get taken advantage of by the COVID scam news. Um, for instance, an email scam used the logo of the World Health Organization to lure users into clicking on a button that unleashes malware. So one thing you have to be careful of is clicking on any links that you may find as it relates to uh, um, something related to the pandemic. Trying to get new, like new information out. There's new information, click on this link. Be careful because People will install, scammers will install malware or spyware onto your computer and it'll, be in, it'll become infected. And what they're trying to do is get your personal identifier information. And for those of you who don't know, when I talk about personal identifier information, I'm talking about things like your social security number, your date of birth, um, you know, your, your, your driver's license number, anything that relates to you. You don't want to give that to anyone in a link that you don't know or that you didn't reach out to yourself in the first place. Um, there was another one when uh, there was a site where Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University um, had a coronavirus map that people would click on to look at different parts of the country to see the, the numbers of people that were uh, uh, affected by the pandemic and installed spyware that can steal passwords, credit card numbers, and other data stored within that web browser. So you, from a cyber security standpoint, you got to be real careful about this too. People are, want, people are looking for news. They want to know what's going on. Um, if something looks, I don't click on anything anymore. <laughs> I click on nothing. If there's a link that I, I never click on it. I just delete it. And I probably miss some important messages that way, but it doesn't matter to me. Um, I just don't click on it and I delete that message. Um, and that's what you got to be careful about because there's so much spyware and malware out there now that you don't want your computer to, to become infected. And if you see something you're not sure about it, call that organization, pick up the phone and call that organization and ask them questions. You're going to be much safer doing it that way than clicking on a link. I've seen people, um, their computers get infected by this type of stuff when they click on a link. Um, just make sure you, you don't do it. And especially if, if you know seniors or, or you have family members that are seniors, make sure you, you, you talk to them about frauds and scams because you want to make sure that they're doing the right things as well. Grandparent scam. Grandparent scam has been around, it's been around for the last probably 20 years. What the grandparent scam is, is someone will call an adult and uh, just a, a stranger will call an adult and, and, and Someone answers the phone and they may, the person on the other end of the phone may say, hi, grandma or hi, grandpa. Um, and of course, the grandparent or the victim may say, oh, hey, is this uh, Johnny or is this, is this Sarah? Um, and they could say, yeah. And once they get a name from a grandparent, they'll try to use that to their advantage. You remember at the beginning, I talked about this being emotional. Um, there's not a lot of grandparents out there who don't want to help their grandchild. So this is one that's been around for a while, and, and the scammers have been very successful in this one. Um, again, because it ties in the emotion. And I think emotion is one of the overriding factors of someone becoming a victim or not. Um, they may say, hey, I need some money for a, a COVID test. Or, you know, I, I've been in an accident and I need some money. Um, could you wire me some money? It's always wire me money because they want it right away. But these are red flags that you have to really remember because um, if there's somebody who's calling you who doesn't know who you are, they're trying to get the information from you on the phone. So they'll play the role of a grandchild. And that's why it's, it's called the grandparent scam. It, it, again, it's, it's still around. Um, a lot of times now it's, hey, I need money for a COVID test. Or some other type of something came up. Could you wire me the money? And uh, of course, people don't get anything, they lose their money. And in this one, you know, you, what I tell families to do, the best way for a senior to avoid being scammed in this area is come up with a family password, okay? So maybe the family password is um, 
grandparent. So when someone calls and the, the grandparent is not sure who that person is on the other line, they can ask them, what is our family password? Uh, Jimmy or Sarah? Um, and it, of course, they're not going to know that. And you're going to hear click because they're going to hang up. But your family would know that and you would know that. So that's a way we tell people use that as a, as a way to protect your, yourself from this scam. Because you'll never be taken advantage of if you, if you have a family um, password. And your password could be anything that the, whole, the entire family knows. But, but share it. And that's the best way to keep safe. As I talked about this scam, the, the scammer continues the conversation use, using the name that the grandparent provided. The scammer doesn't know the name of your grandchild, but they'll try to get it from you. They may say, oh, hey, grandma, it's me. It's your favorite, your favorite grandson. It's like, oh, Tim, how are you, Tim? How are things? You know, I mean, they, they try to get it any way they can. The scammer will ask the grandparent to keep the situation between them. They'll say, do, you know, do me a favor and don't call mom and dad because they'd be mad if I knew or I'm embarrassed to call them. That's why I reached out to you. Um, again, red flags, red flags for this type of scam. There was a COVID cleaning service scam and that has gone around. Um, a tactic like the vaccine scam, many fraudsters call or email posing as professional cleaners or similar service providers offering to sanitize your home or businesses. We'll take care of any COVID germs that may be in your house. Now, while there are businesses that specialize in service or cleaning service, they're not engaged in randomly calling potential customers out of the blue. That's the red flag in this scam. You get a phone call unsolicited and they'll tell you that we, we come into your home and we'll clean. That's a huge red flag. You don't want that because you'll become victim of a scam. So hang up. Um, if you don't reach out to a company to do some cleaning service, then you just gotta be careful because generally the scammers are the ones that are proactive and they, they'll try to reach out to you. Phishing scams. You know, I, li I like to fish, but I like the F-I-S-H phishing, not this type of phishing scam. Phishing scam is a term that's used for emails that claim to be from your bank, a reputable business, or a government agency. Now, scammers are really, really good at putting these together. Um, you may get something from your bank that looks exactly like your bank. It has the bank logo on it. It has all the information as it relates to your bank. Um, they may be asking you something like, you know, we're, we're doing a, a review of your account and, and we need your, we need your, your, your password or we need your um, social security number. Um, if you think about this scam, and I always tell people, I'm like, well, wait a second. If you're my bank and you're calling me to get my social security number or my account number, you already have that because you're my bank. Obviously that's a scam. If you think through these scams, they generally will fall apart like a house of cards, but you got to think through them. And these scammers know that. So they try to take advantage of, of people uh, relatively quickly. So these types of scams, people will ask for personal information, social security numbers or account numbers to steal funds or steal your identity. It's a phishing scam. So you don't know whether it's legitimate or not. But if you have a question about it, call your bank or call the company because uh, you're not gonna just get unsolicited um, emails from your bank asking for your account number. It's not gonna happen. And why they call it a phishing scam is because now what scammers can do is they can perpetrate these, these frauds and scams right from their basement on a computer. Um, and they can send it out to people in mass. So when you fish, you, know, you, you, you throw your net out to try to catch as many fish as you can. That's what scammers are trying to do. They're trying to uh, get as many victims as they can. A scammer is not just looking at one person. A scammer is looking to defraud hundreds or thousands of people. That's what they do. So just keep in mind that if you're getting something that looks not legitimate, other people are getting the same exact thing. And if one person falls for it, then they may have you know, made the, you know, the money that they were hoping to make for one person. They just need one victim. You know, and if, if nobody falls for it, the scammer will have to try another way to rip people off. The Nigerian letter email scams. I think you probably all have seen these. 
if you go into your, uh, your, 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 your junk or your, your, your junk mail, you'll, you'll see things like this. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a letter that says someone from another country um, has a, a great sum of money in the millions of dollars and wants to give you some of it so you can secure it in your bank for them. And they'll give you a great portion of that money. Absolute 100% scam. And I mean, this has been around for a while now. So people know a lot about it, but it still happens. And like I said, go into your junk mail and, and, and look for some of the emails in there. I guarantee you have these emails in your junk mail or in your regular email, um, but you do have them. And the letter, it, it sounds, you know, this, this one I have listed here says, um, dear friend, it is indeed my pleasure to write you this letter, which I believe will be a surprise to you. I actually found your email address at the trade and email listings here in Pretoria, South Africa. I work at the Ministry of Minerals and Energy in South Africa and have the mandate of two of my senior colleagues to search discreetly and diligently for a foreign partner that could assist us concerning a business matter, which will be a mutual benefit to all. So that's continues on with asking you for uh, your account number. So they, they said they could try to deposit the money into your account. Uh, absolute scam. And they call them Nigerian letters because these first started in the US mail and now they've gone via, via email because it's much easier to, uh, for a scammer to press a, a send button than it is for them to, to uh, put these letters together to put into the mail. As I said before, if you, if you respond to these emails and you send the money, if you wire the money internationally, that money's gone. You can forget getting that money back. There's no way to be able to get it back because it's gone immediately. And that's the thing we like to tell people too. Um, chances are you will not get money back if you send money out of the country via wire to someone you don't know. Um, there's been COVID cure scams. Um, it's not a scam in the same, same way that fraudsters use emails to target people. Many businesses have attempted to sell their existing product treat as treatments or even cures for COVID-19 or coronavirus. I mean, we've all heard of these different um, products that can be used to, to, to cure people of, of, of COVID. Um, the FTC and the FDA have issued warnings against at least seven companies that the agencies say have been misbranding products, regular products that they sell, as treatments or preventatives against coronavirus. Products include teas, essential oils, and colloidal silver. So again, you have to be careful. Let the buyer beware what you're purchasing and, 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 and do your research. People won't fall for scams if they do their research because they'll find very quickly that the, the, the information that the scammer has given the potential victim is not true. And it's easy to find out if people just take their time and do your research. And I've told people, if you ever hear, you need to act now. Well, and no, I know I don't. Oh, I can act. You know, if you act tomorrow, this deal goes away. No, that's not going to happen. So never feel pressured to, I got to do this today or it's gone. It's, it, it's a bunch of crap. And you can take as much time as you need to make a decision, a business decision. So make sure that you, you know, you, you, you do that. Do your own research and you'll find that you'll find out if something is a scam or it's not a scam. Talk a little, I talked a little bit earlier about sweepstakes and lotteries. Um, sweepstakes and lottery is if you know, you're told that you've won a sweepstakes or say the Canadian lottery. You're asked to pay for processing fees, taxes or delivery and provide a bank account number to verify your winnings. So this is one that I can tell you right now, um, people never receive the money. Uh, if someone contacts you and says you're a big winner and, and who doesn't like to be a winner? Is there anyone that doesn't like to be a winner? I think everyone likes to be a winner. Um, you think you've won something, but you need to pay $5,000 for taxes or processing fee first before you get your money. So if somebody calls up and says, you want $100,000, uh, but you got to pay 5,000 to be able to get it and pay taxes or pay international fees, that's a, that's a big one. You know, I would say, well, you know what, just take the, take the 5,000 out of the 100,000 and send me 95,000. You know, it's never going to happen. So, you know, think about these. They don't make sense. You should never, ever, ever have to pay for anything if you've won something. 
not a dime. Remember that. So that's a huge red flag. If you enter a sweepstakes or lottery, um, you've been determined to be the winner and someone's asking you for, for money, fraud or scam. And again, no one ever receives a penny for these except for the thieves. As I said, you should never have to pay anything if you're a winner. Work at home scams. Um, over the past year and a half, work at home scams have been around for a long time, but they exploded during the height of the pandemic. And why? Because people were quarantined at home. People were working from home. So the work at home scams be, took on a whole new life uh, during, during the pandemic. Um, these are scams working from home. Um, oftentimes it may sound like a leg legitimate job and hey, look, I'm at home, so I might as well make some extra money, right? Well, first of all, they're going to ask you to pay for some supplies that they send you. Um, and then you pay for something and then you don't get it. That's, that's the bottom line on these work, work from home scams. But they try to really in and certainly people were more vulnerable during the quarantine period because they were working from home. They were at home. So they, the, the scammers knew that. Um, as I said, if you respond, you'll be asked to pay for supplies um, up front. They might ask you for your credit card, your bank account number, social security numbers. Uh, these, are, these are for fraudulent purposes. Um, they don't want your, your, your credit card number uh, only to verify who you are. They're gonna use it to purchase things or to, to apply for credit in your name. That's identity theft. So these will tie into identity theft depending on the personal identifier information that they, get, they receive. So you need to be really careful about work at home uh, offers it, it, just in general. Cover some of the warning signs of fraud. I talked during this presentation, I've talked a lot about red flags. So these are some, these are the, the summary of the red flags that I want people to take from this presentation. If you are asked for your personal information, that's a red flag. And depending on who you're dealing with, you need to uh, ensure that you're not giving that information out to anyone that you're not, you haven't contacted. If somebody reaches out and contacts you, um, be very, very careful and suspicious in anything you do with them. And because they're gonna try to wanna get some of your personal information. You're asked to donate to an agency whose name sounds like a well-known charity. We already talked about this, but they will reach out to you. These fake charity scams will reach out to people and try to get money, especially, as I said, during a crisis time or an emergency situation. If you ever hear you're, only, you're one of only a chosen few to receive this offers, how lucky are you? Boy, they want you to make, they want, they want to make you feel special. You're one of only a few. Well, how, how do you know that? You know, you, are you going to trust someone to tell you that? You know, again, if you do your research, you'll find out that this is not true. But that's a, those are key terms that fraudsters use. Hey, you're only one of a chosen few, but you have to act now. Act now. Act now. I hear, I hear that in my sleep because um, scammers use it all the time. They want to pressure you into making a poor decision. And if you take your time, you will not make a poor decision. Or a courier will come to your house to get your payment. So you've won sweepstakes. We need to collect $5,000 from you. We'll send a courier to your house to get your payment. This is, a real, this is a real problem. You don't ever want to have someone come to your house. If, if a, your doorbell rings and you open it up and there's two people there and they say, hey, you know what? We're doing some work in the neighborhood. And uh, it looks like, you know, the siding on your house needs a little bit of work or your chimney needs some work. We'd be happy to take a look at it. And maybe we could do the work while we're here. That's a scam. Uh, that's a home improvement scam that happens all the time. And what happens is one person will try to um, distract the homeowner while the other person will go in the house and, and, and steal jewelry, money, anything they can get their hands on. And they do it very, very quickly. I mean, they know what they're doing but you don't want anybody to come into your home. Do not let anyone in your home that you don't know who they are. And if you have a couple of people at your home that you didn't ask to come to your house, tell them to get off your property. You're not interested, period. If you wanna make sure that you're safe. 
So I want to tell people how to protect yourselves from, from internet frauds and scams. What happens if you become a victim of a scam? What do you do? Call the police. You need, may need to, you may need a police report to help prove that you were a victim, first of all, um, to, a, uh, to, to a bank, to a credit card company. You may need a police report. So call the police. And I tell people all the time, don't, don't just shake your head and, and say, you know what? Okay, I, I got taken advantage of. The, that information is so important to the police because as I said earlier, if that fraudster is trying to um, take advantage of you, they're trying to take advantage of many others. So as much information as the police can get on a, on a scam, the better for them to be able to, to conclude the investigation <clears throat> successfully. So call the police, first of all. You can contact your state and local law enforcement agencies, such as your district attorney's office or the state attorney general. You can call the, if it's, if it's something that's mail related, you can call the United States Postal Inspectors. And, and I guarantee you, they will respond and they will help in any way they can because that's what they do. And so again, if it's mail related, if it's over the telephone, contact the police, but make sure you reach out to law enforcement in general. And if you call a federal law enforcement agency and you're not sure who to talk to, they're gonna help you. They're gonna tell you who you need to get in contact with. So there is help out there, but you need to make the call. And there's many, 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 many seniors that don't do that. And it just makes me, makes me really sorry for the people that are scamming these, uh, these seniors because they know that there are some people out there that they're not even gonna, not even gonna call the police. They just won't do it. So um, that's my presentation. I wanna open it up to any questions that you may have. Um, you know, again, this is, this is something that's not going to stop. It's going to continue to go on. And I want to make sure that, uh, any questions you may have that I might be able to answer. I'm more than happy to do that. So Tim, I'm not sure how you want to do that, but I'm happy to, happy to answer. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you. I wasn't muting everybody on entry into the, uh, into the uh, chat room. So go ahead and feel free to unmute yourselves to answer questions. And I think my first question to our speaker is why did you get involved in law enforcement and security and particularly the scam in the first place? Was it something that happened in your life or was it just an interest? I'm just kind of curious how you fell into this field. <clears throat> yeah, it's a good question, Tim. Um, so I've always been a, a, a people person. I've always felt that I wanted to help people and as many people in law enforcement um, do. But we had a, a when I can was- Can you want to share your screen now? Oh, so I'm can, sorry. That's yeah. okay. I can, I, can, I can take it off too, if you'd like. No, I got it. Okay, sorry. thanks. Yeah. Like I said, feel free to unmute everybody. This is our open forum on our questions. So, all yeah. right, Tom, so, please continue. I didn't mean to interrupt you there. No, that's okay, Tim. So yeah, I one of my family, when I was, in my 20s, one of my family members was uh, was murdered, um, oh. and it was my my mother. And I was always, uh, you know, that really cemented my 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 thought to get into law enforcement because wow. um, I wanted to make sure that I I did everything I could to um, whatever I you know whatever I could bring to the table. Um, I wanted to put people behind bars to to commit crimes. So that was my motivation at the time. Um, wow. But again, I have a real love for, uh, for helping people. And I think that's goes back to, you know, my personality, but I wanted to make sure that I could do whatever I could do my part to make the world a better place. But why the post office then? Well, it was interesting because I actually got a job at the post office, a part-time job, kind of as a, as a fluke. And I didn't, I didn't understand that they have federal law enforcement agents that uh, oversee the operations of the U S postal service. So here's another Tidbit, and if you want to win a, a, a bet with your friends, the U.S. Postal Inspectors are the oldest federal law enforcement agency in the country. Wow. They, they, they were created in 1774 when Benjamin Franklin, was, was the first postmaster general, created them to go out to the post offices in the colonies and bring postmasters to account, which means audit them. So they've been around for, since the late 1700s. And um, 
a very well-respected organization, a very, very well-respected in law enforcement. And they're the same, Tim, as any other federal law enforcement, FBI, DEA, ATF. We're all the same. We all carry firearms and we make arrests. Um, but I was fascinated by them when I was working for the post office part-time. And, and it took me two years to become an inspector. I had to go through a lot of different screening processes. And uh, I was, I just, I was able to get through and I became an inspector and I was with them for 26 years. Wow. Well, that, that, that sounds great. Okay. Let's get up, open up for other questions. Uh, um, I have, I have a question. This Ellen. Um, okay, Ellen. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, thank you for your talk. Uh, my question or it, based on experience and kind of a frustration is that like my family got scammed by a, by a honey pot scam, you know, um, got the stepfather. So it was kind of a personal hit, but um, you know, and there was nobody to report it to. And I, I still, uh, that got me investigating, but you know, my, my hypothesis, and I'm wondering if you ever investigate yourselves, you know, um, at one point my family would call in and say, oh, we're going out of town, be sure we don't get robbed. And we got robbed. And the, after about three times, they realized it was the police robbing us. You know? oh. And so I think it's often, especially, I hate to say it, Homeland Security. I know a guy around here who called Homeland Security and uh, then they came and tasered him and tried to prosecute him for, you know, for reporting against them. So to what extent would you say that internal uh, investigations are needed to uh, route out corruption from the very, very, very top? Um, really the, you know, police force, the FBI, the postal service uh, that is never really looking at the supply side of the corruption, especially when it's themselves. Yeah, well, Ellen, first of all, I'm sorry about, you know, the things your, your family had to go through. And again, I, my my heart goes out to you because I, I hate to hear stories like this. And um, yeah, it's from my perspective, it's, it's, it's very, very rare that you would see uh, police officers involved in these types of scams. Um, is that to say that it doesn't happen? No. But right, again, but they don't important. investigate themselves, especially in Chicago. Right, Ellen, 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 let him finish, please. Right. Mm -hmm. So most of the most every law enforcement organization has an has an inspector general, yeah. Okay. Yeah. and the inspector general, uh, their the postal service has one. So when I was a postal inspector. There was a U.S. Postal Service inspector general. They're they're law enforcement agents as well, and they're they're the ones that investigate any type of fraud, waste, or abuse within an organization. So if there's yeah. fraud, waste, or abuse, they'll be the ones to investigate that. And, and if I'm an inspector and I'm committing frauds and scams, they would be investigating me. And, and, and every agency has their own inspector general. Yes, they right. do. Right. I agree. But and believe um, you me, they, they do. Are, boy, are they rough. Do they actively, you know, um, actively do it? it? Like when I went, I got a scam just on the telephone. Um, and I have been scammed, uh, you know, trying to fix my phone and then they locked it up and then they wanted me to, you know, put money on a credit card and send it to them. And but um, but and then you go to the FBI to try to, you know, fill out. You only can put in so many words. And I don't know what they did with that. But I, why aren't they actively like, you know, nipping it from above all these telephone scams? I mean, they just don't seem to. Do you do any, you know, actively like trying to stop it from from the telephone or from the supply side, you know, or use the infrastructure, the digital ability to go in there and track them down and make them stop? Yeah. I mean, it sounds yeah. like it just go out and tell the consumer, be aware, yeah, but him, uh, I'm like, finish. okay. That's okay. I think that, you know, my philosophy has always been, there's a lot more people in the public than there are in law enforcement a heck of a lot more. So if people are educated and they don't become a victim of a fraud or scam, then there's nothing to investigate. You know, that, that's just a philosophy I have. I think prevention is really, really important because I've seen people get taken advantage of, but I can speak for my organization. Yeah, we work these fraud cases. 
and we, we work them really, really hard, you know, and, and they're, sometimes they're very complex because there's a multitude of victims maybe across the country. And if there's people um, that are committing this from international perspective, it becomes much more challenging to investigate someone from another country who we don't have a, a, a relationship with law enforcement in that country. Okay, so, I, ha I have a question. Sorry. Can I? Okay, um, thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you so much for your speech. Uh, my question is, how come, uh, it's not like regularly, but how come when I check my email, you know, uh, some so much scam and so much fraud in inbox and very seldom to spam, if you know what I'm talking about. So my question to you, how to, of course I delete because nobody wanna, you know, nobody wanna scam, but how how they do that and, and who do this? And even if you, uh, I have Yahoo, you know, like uh, yahoo.com. So yeah. if, even if you call them, so they, they, I don't know, they, they say they will respond later or whatever. They put on hold and they, you have to wait. And you know, like, like they don't have answer either, but how, how those hackers or scammers, how they, uh, let's say not only hack my email or people email and going to inbox and once in a while to spam. But anyway, I delete spam and spam, but I just curious. Uh, how how they do maybe you, you your opinion thank you sure well I, you know as I mentioned earlier in my in my talk the scammers are are, are trying to throw a wide net so they'll use as many um, emails as they can to mm -hmm. get a, a one scam to everybody so it's much easier to hit send and me send it out to you know 2500 people than it is for me to try to do a, a you know like one letter or one mm -hmm. uh, piece of mail that's going to scam one individual person. So they but just it's caused them to do this. I mean, they pay for this or is they they do like like mm -hmm. free, right? But it's like random, right? Yeah, they so just yeah, they just they just gather email addresses, which you know isn't isn't hard to do. Um, and they try to get it out to as many people as they can. But most like I receive by scam, which I'm, I mean, by uh, um, by spam, yes. which I'm happy. So but I Charlie, let, let her Thank finish. You. No, no, Tim, are you going to tell me She's done, Charlie. Okay. She's done, Charlie. So go ahead. The next question, please. <laughs> Charlie, you know, you're the one who's right now interrupting most of the people on the. Uh, yeah, phone, and I so. will continue to if you <laughs> fail to do. Monitor the meeting. We are moderating, Charlie. Would you please quit interrupting people? The same All people right, let's let's do suck into week. our next question. Yes, do, you five have a, questions. do you have a question, Charlie, or not? Yes, very simple. <laughs> and it doesn't take 25 minutes for me to ask a question. Maybe I'm skillful in some fashion. No, I'm with it. But, sir, uh, I, I, is anybody putting, I noticed. There's a lot of use of videos posted on the internet uh, of question of value and merit. Uh, has this been used in fraudulent methods in any fashion that have been brought to your attention or is that giving away their source too much? Yeah, I'm sorry, Charlie, could you, could you repeat your question? You, you, you kind of stopped uh, there. Is anybody using videos there are many videos being posted now are these are to get email names or links or are they being used fraudulently uh as a fish bait for example uh is in your experience are videos suspect is what i'm asking yeah, videos can be suspect and it depends on what the video uh, perpetrates because sometimes marketing companies will use videos um, and scammers will try to replicate them the same way. Because what does a marketing video do? It tries to entice you to either purchase something or, or donate to something. Scammers will do the same thing. I mean, there, there's, you know, there's, they have a wealth of technology at their advantage and they'll try to use every bit of it that they can. Now, I don't know the specifics of the video, but I will know, I will, I can't say very confidently that scammers will use videos as well to entice people 
to possibly become a victim of a scam. Certainly. All right, who's got the next question? Um, if not, Thomas, uh, I'd like to hear one of your most prouder uh, tales of a, of a scam that you helped uh, crack. Wow. Well, I can tell you this. Um, so I mentioned that the Postal Inspection Service goes back to 1774. Uh, the first six years, six years of my career, I worked, I worked investigations, you know, in Chicago because Chicago Division was my my first assignment, and uh, I did work um, some on the Ted Kaczynski case back in the early '90s. Um, did some interviews on that case, but I think the the one case that I, I still I still am, am kind of known for is that um, I I worked some undercover. I did some undercover work, and uh, this was a a uh, the case was a workers' compensation fraud scam, where they were defrauding the government by saying that they couldn't, an uh, employee couldn't work. Well, I found out that the employee was was not only getting paid, and this was the amount of about uh, $350,000 that they had, had gotten from the US government, um, couldn't work, but I found out through a source that this individual was a skydiver. So the government actually paid for me to learn how to skydive. This was the early 90s. And I actually went skydiving with this person in an undercover role. And I worked that case for about a year. So I, I, out of the history of the Postal Inspection Service, I was, I, I'm the only inspector that's ever gone skydiving on a case, which was, was pretty cool. So that's still one of my claims to fame. The person was arrested. The person was arrested and convicted. And it was important that I... That I, 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 I so Jeff, okay, I so how does this, play? I mean, now I've noticed from this other thing, she's like, good morning and stuff. So I don't know if I should say good evening, <laughs> you know, but I, you know, so I'm just responding. I said, all is well, thank you. Um, good to know the dress code. Um, regarding Ellen, the you? dress code, I have a problem with my feet. Ellen, are you, are you, are you speaking to us I here? We're supportive. Therapeutic shoes to prevent pain slash deterioration. Ellen, Ellen, I think she not must shoes not may not be considered. Mute her. May not be considered business casual. You need to mute well, I put her, that in parentheses. Tim. I just uh, did. All right, yeah, so go a, ahead, I, I have a question. This is Doug. Uh, um, Tom, since you told us an anecdote about skydiving, is there any chance you could get uh, this guy DeJoy uh, to skydive with you and? Uh, have something go wrong with his shoot? <laughs> you know, it, it, what it was, it's actually, it's, it's actually funny that Doug, that you mentioned that because this, this case went to, uh, went to trial and I had to testify. I was saying, because the, the, the defense was argument was that skydiving is not, is not physical. I'll tell you right now, skydiving is completely physical yeah. um, because you are, your hands are up in the air the whole time. To try to operate the toggles that's how you steer it and it's 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 really it is very physical so it was important that i testified but after the case was over the uh the the defendant said to me uh inspector brady i understand that you you're doing your job and blah 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 he says you know and and, I, and i'm going to obviously he got he got time in jail and he said um you know if you if in the future if you ever want to go sky skydiving again <laughs> reach out to me, you know, and I looked at him, I'm like, I shook my head and I'm like, so are you, are you going to pack my shoot too? Is that why you're asking me? But it was a true story that he said that at the end, which I thought was, 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 was kind of odd, but it kind of relates to what Doug Did he get me. prosecuted or was he convicted? He this yes. guy? Yeah. He was, mm -hmm. yeah. but he forgave you for what was his sentence? <laughs> why was it, he so nice to you about it? What, or Because I'm a nice guy. Yeah, even though no, you I mean, convicted him, you know. Yeah, or, well, I went, it went to it went to trial, you know, and I had to testify mm -hmm. uh, because of the if I now if I didn't go skydiving, I would not have been able to testify in court, and it, you know the, it could have been legitimate that it is strenuous, so the, the the judge may have may have bought that, but it, it's it was not true. It's a, it's a very strenuous exercise. If anyone here's a skydiver, anyone, mm -hmm. anybody, nope. it's strenuous. Plus, it's psychologically impact. It's impactful too. 
What do you know about DeJoy? I don't know. The post, he's the current postmaster that has a bad reputation. Um, he's yeah, a scam know. artist. I, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know much about him, Ellen. So I retired from the Postal Service um, eight years ago. I've been at the College of DuPage now since 2013. I, I retired from the Postal Inspectors in 2013. Uh, on March 28th of 2013, I started at the college on April 1st of 2018. So I had that one weekend of, of retirement. It was awesome. Um, but I've been at the college now for eight years. So I'm a little bit distant from that now. Can't, Can't the postal it, inspectors arrest the guy? Can't they arrest him even though he's their boss? <laughs> that would be no, like, well, I remember, I remember uh, 24 where um, the guy, um, what's his name, um, escapes me for the moment, the, the hero um, played by uh, the Sutherland uh, actor. Um, he actually gets the attorney general of the United uh -oh. States to arrest the president, which could have happened if uh, if Rosen had had a little more guts that time uh, where mm -hmm. he, he had all the information and he could have arrested Trump at that moment. Uh, I don't know why the inspector generals of the post office, they could get together as a group and arrest this guy. What did he do? Uh, what Joy, did, did... Oh, he's, he's done a zillion things. He's, first of all, he slowed down the post office uh, delivery system. He destroyed like millions of dollars of government property and uh, that has not been restored. He should be responsible for that, um, um, both on a criminal matter and on a civil matter. Because he's rich, he should uh, restore those post, post office machines that do the sorting. Oh, he's Everyone's doing... forgotten about that. It's crazy. He should be in jail right now. He's doing what is your opinion different... about that, Mr. Brady? He's doing nothing different than what corporations have done to downsize. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you're you're what? trying to be funny. Yeah, thank you. I I I am funny too sometimes, Tim, but not not on the matter of receiving uh, my mail, which uh, uh, has deteriorated to the point where, and then people I know who uh, sell on eBay and stuff, uh, it's just terrible for them. Absolutely terrible. We find, uh, yeah, I found that I know that the hard way. But let's uh, not get into mail delivery right now. We're trying to. Well, we're getting into scams. I thought it was a good. Yeah, it's a, it's a yeah. Good example, not exactly the type of examples. Of, right, but, uh, can I, I have a question. Uh, you uh, say you worked on the anthrax and did you get it traced back to Fort Detrick and the um, the fact that this Fort Detrick is also where the, the virus and vaccine was developed, a biological warfare place, or was that off limits to investigate and actually prosecute the, um, the guy that was eventually found, you know, a Fort Detrick United States government person mm -hmm. delivered yeah. the anthrax. Did, is that yeah. where you took it back to? Or did you yeah, prosecute? Aim, yeah, so the AIM strain went back to Fort Detrick. And that's what you found? And did you, mm -hmm. oh, I think he died suspiciously before you could get him, right? Um, yeah, did, he committed, uh, committed suicide. What, do you think it could have been a suspicious suicide? Uh, that seems to, happened for like 30 people who could have testified, like William Casey, you know, um, whenever a, somebody wants to testify against the government, they disappear, right? And all the Kennedy assassinations and anything, uh, you never seem to actually, I mean, why don't we go after Fort Detrick, even for the, the vaccine? You know, for the fact that it leaked out of there, the millions of suspicious Ellen, deaths out of there. Okay, well, I'm saying this is the bit. frustrating part of this. Okay, is, we're trying you know, to keep this to uh, scams and. Uh, well, that. Uh, well, I mean, I think you got to get beyond scams and get to actually solving crimes. Well, you like know, I said, let's, let's work it up in the uh, rebuttal period. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Go ahead, GM. A question. Um. um so the speaker mentioned, I think 30% um, of the victims um, are seniors. So the 70% are not seniors. Do you have like number of statistics to show like by rank order, what are the groups that are most susceptible to scams other than the seniors? Yeah, I, I don't have that information, I'm sorry. But just like uh, general knowledge, um, who else are uh, susceptible on a kind of top list other than seniors? Uh, 
uh, when you say seniors, how old are the people you you consider as seniors? I think generally over over sixty, generally, and I think that any, any everybody's susceptible to uh, become a victim of fraud or scam. That's what we're talking about. You know, I don't have the information right with me, um, but every, everybody is susceptible, everyone. Is there anything related to say income level, educational level, ethnicity, any numbers of the factors can kind of point to the populations that are more susceptible than others? Yeah. And I mean, it's a good question, but I never saw um, a, a uh, um, in terms of people that I saw become victims, I saw a wide range. I saw one of the victims I had on my radio show, which was called, which was called Don't Fall For It, uh, was a, a, a doctor, a female doctor that was defrauded in a, in a love scam. And she came on my radio show to talk about it. So, I mean, I've seen people from all walks of life become uh, victims of scams. And that's why I say everybody is susceptible. There isn't anybody that's not susceptible to a potential fraud or scam. You know, young people, middle-aged people, seniors. I mean, I've seen them all become victims of scam. I have an example. Um, it's only about two months ago. Um, I had gotten one of those uh, text messages from the Secretary of State's office and it was, uh, you know, looked like had their logo and everything. And it said that there was a problem with my driver's license and that I needed to contact them because otherwise I might not be able to, to drive. It would be suspended. And um, so at first I thought, you know, it looks so good that there must be something to it. Um, but then I remembered about a year ago, I had my driver's license renewed and I had had cataract surgery or something anyway. So when I got the driver's license, it did have the incorrect um, uh, notation on, you know, there was supposed to be some kind of a restriction because I had cataract surgery that I, I was supposed to have a, um, oh, a side mirrors or something like this anyway. And so they had to reissue me a new uh, license, but I had gotten it in the mail and so that was okay. So when this thing came through, then I said, oh, you know, I don't know, there must be another problem. <clears throat> so luckily I called up the Secretary of State's office and asked them, and of course there was no problem. So I said, okay, it was a scam, but they were not at all interested in trying to track down where this um, text message had come from, which I found was really discouraging that they weren't even interested. They just said, it's a scam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm glad that you didn't fall for that, Claire, you know, certainly. Um, and you did the right thing, you know, you contacted them. There's so much of that out there that it's just, it's just I mean, there, there's so much of it out there. They just don't have the personnel to, to, to look into it, you know. Um, but again, it, it's important from my perspective, it's important because every piece or every scam that presents itself is a uh, opportunity to identify a scammer, in my opinion. But again, it goes back to what organizations have in terms of resources and what their priorities are in the in the in these cases and that's that's kind of the you know the the not the the great answer but i think that that's true that it comes down to resources what okay charlie has the next question then michael kazanjian has the next question so go ahead yeah quickly uh sir uh, is there an uptake on two areas of uh fraud. Number one, I'm getting a lot of calls about changes in social security. And number two, is anybody out there offering cures for cures or treatments for COVID, which may, uh, may be of questionable value? Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think I mentioned that, um, that COVID cures are still something that scammers are trying to put out there. Um, and again, I'm not, a, I'm not a doctor. I don't know anything about like what can be used, but I do know that they're oftentimes the scammers don't have anything. And they're trying to entice people to make a purchase of something that doesn't exist. And I do know that that's, that has increased Charlie during the pandemic for sure. Those types of scams. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, the first part Charlie was what? 
social calls about social security. Yeah, people have gotten calls um, and from the IRS, uh, from social security, um, people identifying themselves as working for those organizations. And that's a scam that's been going on for a while. That doesn't, that doesn't happen. Those organizations do not operate that way. They're not gonna reach out to you um, just you know, randomly over the phone and say, this is the IRS, you, know, you owe us $5,000 in back taxes. Um, they, they don't operate that way. So that won't happen. So anytime you get a, a, a call from an agency, um, that's something that you have to uh, investigate and, and, and you know, do some background yourself to find out if it's legitimate or not. Nine times out of 10, it's not gonna be legitimate. Okay, uh, okay, Alan, uh, Mike Michaels next, and then Richard Stuckey. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Tim. Uh, thanks very much for your presentation tonight. I have um, now two questions. Uh, one, you said um, that you had done undercover work. Uh, you don't have to tell me, obviously, and I don't wanna know the uh, person or group for which you did the undercover work, but uh, I assume that you did this for a government agency or or private agency? And second, um, uh, how much would you say, as far as you know, is the biggest amount of money that has been scammed from victims? Oh, gosh. Well, to, to Michael, to answer your first question, yes, I was working as a, as a, as a US Postal Inspector when I worked undercover. So oh, was, oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. It was in my, re my regular job. Yeah, you, uh, um, yeah I wasn't, uh, uh, for security reasons, I wasn't interested in the organization. You didn't have to name it, but that's, that's fine. Okay, it was thank my you. job. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, the other one, I mean, you've seen people get uh, built out in billions of dollars. Um, you know, if, you feel, if you've seen some of these Ponzi scams that are a fraud, um, Bernie Madoff comes to mind. Yeah. Uh, where you're talking about millions of dollars, people, you know, being scammed into millions of dollars. I don't know what if there's a record. I do know that that's one of the, the largest ones in, in a Ponzi scheme that's ever, that's ever been, um, that's ever been. So, I mean, that, that's, that's one that I would point to in terms of uh, a, a large complex fraud in the millions of dollars. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you for the presentation. Yeah, um, a couple of couple of examples. Um, I got caught 15 years or so ago on the uh, renting an apartment online uh, scam, where you had to sort of uh, you found a, a, a nice looking ad for a beautiful looking apartment in a building I happen to know about somewhere over in England, and uh, you could get a deposit on that one for a certain weekend. And uh, when you get there to, to go to the place, there's not an apartment there. No one knows anything about it. Uh, just uh, you just the deposit. I got two of them in one, in one week there, one in London, one in Paris that were like that. That was before the days of, of Airbnb. So there was no real alternative. Any way of detecting something like that? I mean, I presume there are perfectly good legitimate apartment ads as well. But uh... yeah, there, I mean, the, again, it's, 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 I've, I've read recently where the same type of scam, Richard, that you just uh, talked about, um, people are still trying to uh, proliferate them on, on, on Verbo and on Airbnb. Okay. Um, the same type of thing. I've, I've just read something last week about that. So you um, can't guarantee yeah. if you see an Airbnb that someone's checked it out, it could still be a scam on Airbnb and Vivo and those places. Correct. Correct. You have to be very, I mean, you have to be very careful. It's again, you know, I, I, I've, I've been, uh, I've looked at, um, uh, what is it? I don't know. There, I've looked at some different uh, websites uh, where people are, are, are you know, selling things. That scares me more than anything because you don't know who you're dealing with. You don't have any protections. Um, again, that's 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 very tricky, uh, and it's 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 a real opportunity for someone to become victim of a, a fraud or scam, um, whether it's emotion or, or greed, uh, you know, whatever the motivation is, but. I'd be very, very careful about that, you know, um, yeah. and never mm -hmm. send money to something that you, or to someone that you don't know. Just don't send money to them and, and you'll be safer off. I have, I, I have a question, uh, very quick. Um, again, thank you so much for your speech. Um, my question is, don't you think, like your opinion, don't you think, oh, Yahoo, Gmail, Hotmail, 
don't you think they're supposed to warn uh, customers and clients so it's going to be like so much scam and fraud? Don't you think it's going to be right if they can, you know, like warning customers about that? Well, I mean, whatever company, I think it's a good idea, certainly. <laughs> Um, again, but I, I can't I can't speak for a, a company on what they what they do or don't. Yeah, but um, you know, even even you try to phone like Yahoo, let's say, or a Gmail or Hotmail, they never really answer the phone, and they give phone number toll free, you know, like customer service, you know, like twenty four hours and stuff. But they they are wait they are wait to answer the phone and. And uh, it's a good idea if they can warn about those scams and fraud. Thank you. Yeah, I, I yes. definitely agree with you. Thank you. I have a follow up on that question is that I actually I read this in Charlie Paddock's uh, newsletter that um, and he's mentioned it, that the First Amendment, you know, um, doesn't apply to social media where um, and I that, you know, or the first amendment or and whereas I had read, you know, we somehow the idea was, well, there's truth in advertising and, and, but the mail, it used to be that, you know, anything that went across state lines would be, you know, it's like, don't mess with the mail. But um, if social media is, can say, I'm a corporation, I'm not the post office, then they can get away with anything. And I, it's like, again, we've got to, hey. uh, what do you think about addressing the laws and the policies and how there's like just huge loopholes benefiting corporations, corruption. And all, this also ties into honest service laws that were deregulated, canceled in the late 1990s. Have you heard about this? And um, the Citizen Protection Act <coughs> didn't go through, even though it was voted. But again, it's corruption of the, at the Department of Justice and the CIA put in Executive Order 12333 under Reagan that they wouldn't investigate themselves. And so here we've got just a totally criminal state, but hey. nobody to investigate. So what do you think about those? I mean, why can't we get regulations put back in and just regulate things? Well, I'm always for, I'm always for stronger laws. Um, anything that's going to protect consumers more. And get um, the corporations, you know, right, the suppliers Ellen. of the corporations, including the privatized security state, you know, the privatized FBI or Homeland Security. Is that, are they considered a citizen, a civilian organization or a government organization? That seems that I see the CIA calling themselves a civilian All organization. Right, Ellen, Ellen. Whereas, I mean, Ellen. there's got to be regulations over laws. This is Ellen, a question. You're... Stop shutting me up, Tim. Okay, oh, I'll Ellen. shut you up the next time. Just cram it. <laughs> That's all right, Thomas. I, I sometimes these people get a little bit. Uh, In all right. All right. If there's anybody else have a question, otherwise, I'd like to get the rebuttals if we can. I have I, one I, more example that I'd like his comments on. So what do you think of uh, the FDA in social media uh, putting out a message saying, uh, don't use ivermectin, you're not a horse, when in fact ivermectin is for human beings and is very, very effective as a treatment and that there are thousands of doctors who are getting in trouble for prescribing it because the FDA and the CDC do not want competition for the vaccine or for monopiravir or whatever. That, I think, is a sign of corruption at what uh, Ellen was talking about. Do you have any uh, ideas on where, what that means, that the, the FDA is giving us lies? Okay. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say. I'm asking okay. you your opinion. Yeah, I mean, I, I again, I I don't know enough about that topic to, to give okay. you a you know a, a, an opinion on it. Um, that's not part of my presentation, so I apologize. Okay. But and Tim, my time is running low, so I'm going to have to 
I'm going to have to yeah, understand. I, Bob Matter okay. wants to ask one more question, and then we'll go. We'll take it from there. Okay. Right. Right. And then I know this your time's is, running low. This is my this is my first question. Uh, my only question, I guess. Um, I recently uh, became aware of uh, you know a scam on uh, GoFundMe. Uh, some lady was somehow ended up on television, and she marched uh, two or three little girls in a room with her, and they had a new you know somebody a new a news crew. And she was given this big sob story that she was homeless and had been evicted or something. I can't remember why, because of COVID or a fire or something. And somebody set up a GoFundMe page for her, and they, you know, she collected about fifty thousand donations. And then a couple of weeks later, it came out that this woman was just a, a scammer. Those those the children she had were children that she was babysitting for. And uh, she just got on TV and did this scam. And, you know, who, uh, who's, who's policing over that? That's not something that the, uh, that the uh, Postal Service would get involved in, I don't think. So who no. watches over these? Who do you, who you contact for these Internet scams? Yeah, that's a good question, Bob, because, uh, you know, some of them uh, proliferate from, as I said, overseas. First of all, Go, GoFundMe should be... Should be uh, um, you know, watching their own um, product, you know, and so first of all, it should be in the hands of the uh, of, of the company to be able to protect consumers against things like that. I don't know what they're doing. I, I can't speak. I can't speak to say they they they're not doing something. I don't know uh, enough to say. But um, generally, if 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 a crime's been committed, then someone can be looking into it, whether it's local police, if it's a, a, a something local, or it could be federal if it's, uh, you know, across, across, you know, state lines. So it's, you know, it's hard to say, I don't know who's, who, who if anyone is looking into that right now, it, it, but I do think that GoFundMe should be working with law enforcement to say, Hey, this, this came up and, and this is not, this is not right, but it's happening. So they, they should, they should be working with them. And I'm sure they have a relationship with, with law enforcement. It makes me wonder uh, how many uh, GoFundMe programs, you know, that show uh, a little kid with bandages on his head and somebody asking for money for brain surgery or something for their kid. I just wonder how many of those are, are real and how many are fake now. Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. What What's your, and I'll, I'll make this our last question. What's your opinion about porch pirates and fraudulent returners on the internet? Well, they're, they're criminals. Um, you know, people are stealing mail from uh, that's been delivered to someone's house. It's a crime. Um, you know, we used to work uh, cases like that for sure. And, and we're talking about people that would do it prolifically where they were, you know, stealing a lot of that type of merchandise. So we did, we worked those cases in Chicago um, mm. back in the day. And it's, it's even grown more since the advent of you know, Amazon and those other delivery uh, companies that come. And so, yeah, they should be, they should, you know, if, if nowadays people have such great video at their homes, you know, and I've seen, you've probably seen some of these videos with these ring doorbells and I mean, those are, those are great because it, that's what you, you pick up on those is people stealing packages from, from your, uh, from your porch and, you know, reshippers, that's been a problem for a while, you know, and again, I talked about work at home scams. Um, when I was working back in, you know, this is going back 10 years, there were people that would be, um, getting a job uh, working from home as, as a reshipper. And they were actually shipping out uh, um, fraudulent merchandise unbeknownst to them. So some people have taken it, you know, have, have become kind of uh, uh, doing reshipper fraud without even their knowledge, you know, no, no intent, just looking, you know, to, to, to make some money from home. So yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a crime as well. Tim and they should be they should be prosecuted. With the nature of my job, I I asked that question. Okay, I know you um, are wanting to get a little bit to going or whatever. So what I'm going to do is open it up for rebuttals now, and I'll uh, give everybody maybe say five minutes to uh, rebut. You can stick around, Thomas, if you'd like, or just sit back with a cup of coffee or whatever and relax. So. Uh, I'm sure all of you guys have got tales of the mail or tales of a, of a fraudster. So if who wants to do the first rebuttal, um, I'll go. Okay. And then go Doug and I, then Margaret. I, and just start I, I want to 
Yeah. Want everyone to know that I've developed a drone that will uh, save you, protect you from any scam artist at all. This drone has oh. artificial intelligence. It is invisible. <laughs> it, will, it will hover over your house. It will go over your car if you drive um, anywhere in the United States. Uh, it might not be able to protect you if you go into Soviet Russia, but excuse me, Russia. <laughs> dating myself. But this drone will, will intercept your internet. It will protect you against those filthy scammers with artificial Yay. intelligence will figure out any scam and will delete email in advance. You oh. simply have to send your Bitcoin to <laughs> russia.scam.us <laughs> and pay $1 million. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Are you going to need a GoFundMe page to start the product concept? Oh, do you wish to get in on ground floor like when Amway? You American Skanskis can figure out good things when you are very smart. Yes. Yay. And then God go fund me. Yes, Russia. Okay. <laughs> All right. Who's who's next on the rebuttal? Margaret, you had your hand raised, so please go I ahead. I did, but there was somebody in front of me. I don't know if they're still on or not. I, I don't know. Um, okay, I'll go. I just wanted to make a comment to Claire. I'm a retired registered nurse. I have a master's degree in science and nursing. Um, I retired after 35 years and I follow the medical literature about all this and the, um, the ivermectin ha is absolutely contraindicated by the F Federal uh, Food and Drug Administration. It, the people who manufacture it say it is not used. It should not be used for COVID. There are some trials now, but there are no trials that have been completed that show any of no recognized legitimate trials that have been completed that show that it's effective against COVID. And uh, the people who are promoting it or what, I don't know how they're making their money, but the drug company itself who produces it says that it is not to be used to treat COVID. So I, it is used in humans, yes, but only as treatment for parasitic worms, which is also what it's used for. Well, you're shaking your head, but that's what is in the literature so you can do whatever you want. So in the recognized scientific literature that has actual science behind it, I don't know where you got your information, but it's not real information. You're getting it from whatever that you're not looking at your sources. You are not looking at your sources because if you say it can be used against COVID, that's absolutely not what everybody else is saying who are recognized scientific experts on what is going on. So, you know, so that's my two cents. Good night. All right, Margaret, May thanks I, a lot. Charlie, may, I kill I may I respond? Oh, I'll kill uh, your lice. Go ahead, go ahead, Claire, respond, and then we'll move on. All right, to thank you. Battle. I would really recommend people look at Frontline Critical Care Alliance. They are doctors who have treated thousands of people in the United States and in other countries and in places like Uttar Pradesh in India. And they are on the front line and they have written papers, including there are two doctors, Dr. Paul Merrick, who is a, uh, one of the founders of flccc.net. And he has something like 400 peer reviewed papers that he has written. And he is a practicing physician as we speak. And he, they have conducted trials and they have published. And in fact, even Dr. Merrick was, is one of the um, doctors who uh, made some very important discoveries about the treatment of sepsis. And he is a recognized uh, you know, expert in his, in his field. So I would I recommend people really look at what they are saying and, what, and the testimonies that the other doctors have given 
but I would acknowledge that they are being hounded and they are being suppressed and they are being maligned. And, and, and it is very, very concerning. And the fact is that ivermectin was discovered and developed by Merck. And Merck is now the one company that is producing more monopiravir, which is supposed to be the miracle drug that's going to treat uh, COVID, right? That came out a couple of weeks ago. But ivermectin was developed in the 80s and it was um, used primarily, as you said, as an antiparasitic drug to treat river blindness in lots of places in, in, in Africa and in Asia. And in 2015... Smaller dosage. Smaller dosage used in Africa. Okay, come on, guys. Let's... Uh, anyway, just let me finish. Just let me finish. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My apologies. Claire. Okay, I will give me two minutes. 2015, it was uh, given the Nobel Prize for Medicine because it was very safe, very effective. And then in um, 2020, when nobody was knowing how to treat anybody, uh, lots of these doctors who worked in, in uh, New York and in, on the East Coast and in, in other parts of the States, they started experimenting and they said, let's try. And they found that it was effective. And I know at least uh, half a dozen people in Chicago who were treated. I know somebody who was in, in Swedish hospital only about a month ago. They wouldn't give her ivermectin. She, she got it anyway, and she was out of the hospital in two days. I know her, and she is also a practicing nurse, and she is also has experience in medicine. So yeah, well, those are anecdotal reports, which are the lowest form of evidence. Go on the website and read. Yeah. And I did go on the website, and and yeah. also on the website it says that it's that the that the uh, that this uh, corporation is uh, a small U.S. organization of physicians and former journalists that has advocated for various ineffective treatments for COVID-19. So, that? no, that's, not, that's not accurate. If it sounds um, too good to be true, it probably is. Yeah. Yeah, it is no, too good no. to be true that the vaccine is the solution. That is what we're being told every single day. Okay. You're not yes, hearing is. any information about treatment. All you're hearing is the number of people who die, the number of people who are vaccinated. If you take the vaccine, you don't need the treatment. Vaccinated. Claire, yeah, how many times did you vote for Trump? How many times did you vote for Trump? Let her talk. That's it. Yeah, it's next garbage. week's topic. Next week's topic, folks. All right. Okay, All I, right. have a, I have. Let's, a no, 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 no. Topic. We're I'm doing rebuttals rebuttal. now. Charlie's I'm on next. Rebuttal. He's got us. Okay. Yeah, Charlie's hand is raised for next. So then you'll go after Charlie. Go ahead, Charlie. All right. Uh, oops. Our speaker uh, left us because he had to go. He he has he, he had uh, run out of time, so our speaker's no longer with it's us. Too it's too bad. I was going to ask him how he gets so lucky in those football games. The guy hit, hit the goal and uh, the uh, the post of the uh, of the field goal uh, uh, last time. Uh, the, the last game when the Buccaneers won. <laughs> Tom All Brady, right. come on, can't Did you I get it? My yeah, I, I know. Tom I Brady, know. I got it. Okay, Charlie, go ahead. Okay, can we restore order? All right. We're restoring uh, order now, so go ahead and get your. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed the presentation. I learned a great deal. I've heard it twice now. I'll be eclectic as usual. I knew about one tax fraud that went on for years and years and was virtually infallible because the participants were trying to defraud the government of the United States. And then they, once they discovered that they were defrauded themselves, they couldn't report it because then they would be prosecuted for criminal charges. So that was the perfect scam. The scam you could not report unless you face charges yourself, a participant. There's a uh, thing regarding COVID. There's a TV minister. He's running. He has 50 shows he's run. It is totally fraudulent and full of misinformation. And he solicits information. He wants 12 payments 
I don't know the exact figure of to like $19 a month. And he promises to do something about COVID misinformation. He doesn't yeah. indicate what he's going to do with the money, but send him the money anyway, and he'll get out the truth for you. And this is on TV all the time. Uh, the I don't know how many calls I get that the warranty on my car is soon to going to expire when I have not owned the car since 1980. Uh, there was a fraudulent police association. So this is one they said, oh, this is, oh, so, we, so, so police would have the right equipment. It operated out of a storefront with just tables and telephones. And it was on the same block for a, a period of time where the college complexes used to meet. That's what I mean. I asked what the operation was, and it was a police association right, right where the college met. Um, regarding the internet, be cautious what you see. One of the things I discovered, and I've been doing websites since since the internet first began. I, I in a group called Homestead. We were homesteading the internet. And one of the first things that came to mind, and I'm a veritable expert at this, I can steal any logo and I can duplicate uh, a website that looks exactly like Citibank or Bank of America precisely. And I guarantee I'm an expert at stealing pictures. They try to put checks on that, but I, I, I can get around that. Uh, believe you me, I can duplicate any financial institution post it and make you think it's legitimate, put links up there and so forth. I personally do not post anything anywhere that I try not to use the logo of the organization uh, as, as a precaution. Um, the inspector generals, each agency of the government and in particular the feds has an office of inspector general. If there's any criminal activity by employees, I assure you they will investigate you. And the IG has no sense of humor. I've had to represent employees with them. They're very thorough, precise. And believe you me, I really, really didn't like it because I knew I was up against some tough guys. They're very thorough and accurate and demanding and put people in jail. Any, any civil employee, civil service employee, who, is, who crosses the line. And believe you me, they do put them away. I know any number of them. If you're gonna to contribute to something, I'd recommend not doing it on the phone, go to their website. If you contribute to a political campaign, go to Act Blue. Uh, I can tell you a story about that. Um, let's see. The I actually exposed the fraud. There was the guys working federal buildings they claim to be a federal employee association. I even set up a sting operation. I met, I guess, set up an appointment, took down all their stuff, and then reported them to the authorities and had them thrown out of every federal building uh, in the Midwest. They were sent an alert out to keep these guys out. They claim they just were an association of retired federal employees helping out uh, retirees. Um, Last of all, uh, that's about it. Um, during the week, I watched the marathon. They had you can get these videos. I'd recommend it. They they showed the old TV show, Highway Highway Patrol, with Roger Crawford apprehending these criminals and safe crackers from the fifties. And I thought, actually, I watched twenty five hours of this stuff. But those are real law enforcement guys. Uh, yeah. Last of all, it doesn't surprise me that there's corruption. If you, anytime you have free market capitalism, <laughs> yeah, it's that up from the get go. So yeah, they, all of it, it's corruption from top to bottom, A to Z, beginning to, to the end. All of it is to rob employees, each other, anybody that can because uh, they're motivated 
by the accumulation of wealth. Anyhow, that's very good. See you next week, folks. Thank you. All right. I'm okay. going to. I I'm have gonna... a comment, Tim. Right? Go ahead, Dylan. Go you ahead. Say... You want to you want to rebut you. now? Go ahead. Yes. Um, right. I was so appreciated seeing Claire there. Um, Claire, I think I remember you from the International Socialist Organization where Laura um, Laura was there with us. Dr. Laura, who gave a yeah. talk on the vaccines, right? And um, and has talked about that 5G. And uh, actually, she was one of the first people I was so appreciative who posted on Facebook, you know, I will not be taking the vaccine. And, and now she's probably disappeared from anybody who says anything about the vaccine gets deplatformed from YouTube, uh, Facebook. I've, I've been deplatformed for from LinkedIn. And it's actually, they wrote back the most scientific reason was this Michael uh, Yardley, the head of R&D for Pfizer was gave the most interesting, uh, you know, a convincing reason uh, argument against the vaccine. He said, you know, one, the PCR test was not developed for what they're doing. It's wrong 50% of the time. And, um, but also that viruses are run by T cells, not by the B cells, you know? And so this whole idea of getting your anti- Right, um, yeah, you totally. Know, it, it does. It doesn't work, and um, it, there's dangers in it. But just last week, I posted the danger of this, and by a very scientific guy. And you're right. Millions of scientific guys, two hundred thousand scientists, have been deplatformed for speaking again. For just if you use the word vaccine or virus, that's why Margaret is so misinformed, and um, you know, assertively and aggressively. So I gave a. Actually, Charlie wouldn't let me give a talk on this channel. Now he says he's going to, which, and I hope you will come next week because I, James Fetzis is a very welcome voice. And the truth is we need, I'd like to give a talk. I'll say it now on conspiracy theory. Mark Crispin Miller wrote a book about it, Lance DeHaven Smith. And with um, all investigation starts with a hypothesis and you have to say, is there a conspiracy here? Is the government a fraud? And it turns out, I would, I want to send you, Claire, I don't know if I have your text or, or email, a thing I saw today called Monopoly, a 30-minute, great, uh, most convincing explanation of this, this pandemic as a the hugest fraud that's ever been perpetrated in the world um on all, the whole world it couldn't have happened like this right unless it was top down and he points out that the people that own the world are blackrock vanguard and you know whitney webb is a great resource on this and but you you can only get her on um you have to go to her channel on rockfin but you know that she had said that BlackRock owns half of the world. And according, when you look at this, you realize that, I mean, Google, YouTube, they're all owned. Everything's owned. So you talk about capitalism. We are, we are run a capitalist dictatorship, which is basically what fascism is, you know, but it's these corporations going back to, you know, Morgan and all these, Rothschild and Rockefeller and you're like oh that was then but ever since the 30 or the 80s Bork Nixon or really since the 30s against Smedley Butler they you know when the DuPonts wanted to get rid of Rockefeller and get rid of all the health education welfare you know progressive socialistic you know programs um they they didn't get away with it because Smedley Butler blew the wind the whistle on them, but they go, they figured out if we just go invisible this time. And that's basically what Nixon, the McCarthy era, all these um, banksters behind this takeover the world. It's basically a fascist new world order. Um, look at Jason Burmis, the, um, the new world order, invisible empire. Because when they talk about the deep state, you know, um, Peter Dale Scott talks about it. 
Kevin Barrett's giving a talk next week or Halloween day with Laurent Guillano, the best book I've, I've given talks on it here at the college on called the deep state, 50 years of deep state from, from JFK to, um, to nine 11, you know, I, he, it's just forensic history, uh, but you, you have a hypothesis, you investigate what's going on here. And, that's what I like about James Festus is he taught logic and epistemology. I'm finishing it up that he said, it's not just deductive or inductive, you know, oh, that's my specialty. I, I work in this state and this post office and this law. It, it's like just anybody, you clear me, you know, all of us, this big open, obviously elephant in the room, emperor's new clothes is that this pandemic was created at bio warfare. <laughs> And because the, the vaccine, it's been, it's just censored. It's blacked out with openly. The, you know, I heard a guy say, I don't believe in any censorship of any media except for vaccines. I am going to call every truthful information, I'll call it false information. And it's just the perfect Orwellian formula for insanity. And that's why, you know, people are killing themselves, you know, atomized, like we're all living in 1984 and nobody admits it. So I'm so glad to see Claire saying something truthful and honest. And I, you know, it's hard to be the only one in the room saying something truthful. And uh, that's what education and the entire history of the world depends on. Democracy, life on earth. If we don't get science, people telling the truth about science, we are totally screwed. So anyhow, that's okay. my story. Okay. All okay. right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the next rebuttal, okay, if you don't mind. What Jim, what you want? Jim. What you yes. Very quick, listen, uh, I so appreciate it. Uh, Margaret right now participated. I have to applaud and very big respect for Margaret. But I have a question, if you will allow me just one moment. Margaret? Margaret, listen, uh, um, what I try to say, I also in medical field, but I'm in holistic uh, alternative medicine, which I respect, uh, you know, registered nurse uh, job and stuff. So anyhow, my question to you, don't you think uh, even, uh, you know, like so many nurses, uh, registered nurses, LPN nurses and doctors, and the, they against vaccine. So what's your opinion about it? And I kind of agree with what Ellen said. So it could be conspiracy theory. Are you, you for vaccination? Uh, no, I'm vaccinated? against the vaccination. I'm for treatment, ivermectin. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Treatment. I understand. Let me, to ask, let me ask Margaret. Uh, Margaret, don't you think it's supposed to be voluntarily? vaccination because you know people who even do vaccine they don't know those patients they don't know maybe they have chronic diseases so it's not only my opinion but i guess vaccination is supposed to be absolutely voluntary what's your opinion well i'm not sure i understand your question my question don't you think vaccination is supposed to be voluntarily not like forcing by government to do vaccination, even look what's going on with those uh, city workers and government workers. It's, it's, it's chaos. So don't you think it's supposed to be voluntarily? Well, first of all, it's not a general mandate that okay. everybody has to get vaccinated. That's one. Okay. The second thing is not yet. Not the yet. mandate on is the employers. So okay. if you work for a hospital, you are required right, right. For example, to take the flu vaccine and, and right. the COVID vaccine okay. because agree. you're in a place where you're exposed right, to right. and you're exposing people to yourself. Right, right. So that's the only mandatory. Th if an employer wants to make it mandatory, okay. that's the employer's business. Yeah, yeah. I understand. But what's in another business? What is in, not, in schools, even. I understand, teacher, but it's also very controversial. It's supposed to be very volunteer. What, is, what if uh, teacher? have very bad reaction what if it's side effect uh after you know after a while after those vaccinations so what do you think it's in about in other businesses you know like well i think there's there's over 300 million 300 and something million uh vaccines that have been given in the united states 
something or, almost a million or maybe that's worldwide you know i'm not really sure it's an enormous number mm -hmm. and the the reactions to the vaccines mm -hmm. there there are a few there are a number of people who have uh for example breakthrough infections COVID infections uh there's a number that sometimes people have a bad reaction to the vaccine if they're right. to the whatever's those tend to be very, very small number, relatively small numbers, and they also, it's it's counterweighted by the enormous number of people who don't get the COVID infection because they've been vaccinated. But what about people who have vaccination and they have continued to have some virus, you know, uh, COVID virus? What's up with that? What do you think, like nurse? About I, it? I I I don't know what you're talking about with that. I'm Tim, talking about him, and I can give you. I have a example. question. Yeah, but I, th I think. All right, I, all right. It's not I've got a question for Margaret. Go ahead, Charlie. If Margaret. You Margaret. Margaret. Uh, if you get sick, do you think you should call up somebody like Ileana to get cured? I go down to my doctor at Northwestern. Thank you very much. The, yeah. the thing is, the statistics that you're getting, Margaret, are not are biased statistics. You're not getting the other the other side of the story. You know, I don't understand you because if most medical experts, most physicians, I really doubt the numbers that you have. Two hundred thousand. I don't think so. I, I, I really off. don't yeah. know where, the, well, let's, I don't know where let's those look numbers the come from. But you want to believe it. some crazy person that says you could take an antiparasitic to to treat COVID when that is not what is recommended. Ellen, Ellen, the Ellen, the listen, medical, Margaret, not recommended by your doctor. All right, all right, Margaret, Ellen, Margaret, Margaret, so Margaret, I don't know what the, what the problem okay, is. Margaret. Right. Margaret, so, I'm I'm done with this. Right. Okay, we want to. Oh, okay, 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 guys. Ellen, Margaret, and Ellen. Margaret, professional. Uh, no, Margaret no, we're we're, we're shutting down. Field. We're so shutting down this topic Margaret now. Said. We're shutting down this topic now because I know it's getting a little bit out of it. Okay. Margaret, professional. Margaret, I professional. Know she is. I, I have you a quick question listen. for you. Uh, listen, Margaret. Sometimes you know. We know that, and she doesn't want to talk about it anymore. Okay, good. Correct? Just give me a thumbs right. up, Margaret. All right, anyway, enough said. All right, Doug, you had a question, and then I'm going to do it. Well, I, I, I just wonder, um, so you don't want to take the smallpox vaccine if um, there's a smallpox ep epidemic? Um, <laughs> Ileana, 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 I'm sorry, I never can pronounce your name right, I guess. Yeah. Ellen, Ellen Corley, you, you yeah, don't take, the small you don't want to take the smallpox small vaccine if there's okay, if the okay, smallpox guys. virus comes back or a variant I, of it. I have taken that. I've taken smallpox. I took the I took the. And what's your problem to, to work with in the, a hospital? What's your this problem with different. a vaccine that's been taken by? This is right. not a vaccine. This is gene therapy. This is gene right. therapy. If they never came up with an AIDS vaccine, they never came up with a SARS there, vaccine. There still is no this therapy one is that's a been fake one. Guys, let's, we want to, we know, we could, we could, there's no uh, therapy that's been, it's this will kill you. Remdesivir had like, what, something it. like a 5%? Okay. Uh, it kills you. Reduction only, in, only a fraction I'm, I'm of a it, 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 it is pointless to go on with this. You've got the wrong numbers, You might as well schedule a, a meeting is just the about this. Tim, okay, and, okay. And let's tell let's, people not to talk on. about it otherwise. Probably. I, I, I do have some. Uh, we would like. Uh, no, I'd like you not to die. It will kill you. It gets into your brain and it makes you stupid. Okay. This is not about. What are you talking about? Right, I've been Bob. vaccinated. I've been vaccinated by All right, Pfizer. all right, guys. Bob's gonna if go. We don't talk about this, we're gonna die, there were no, Tim, no so side effects, up. whatever. Okay, no side effects, whatever. I don't know anyone who's had any side effects from the vaccine. You're okay, inventing to, a lot of this. All right, I had to mute Ellen. Well, you're at listening this time to are inventing a lot of it. All right, now uh, let's let's go. Bob, you want to say something or do you have a rebuttal now? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, um, so I have to, I have to. I just have to mention COVID because it's part of the a scam thing. I have to mention, uh, and I just wanted to say that uh, uh, last Sunday and Monday, I spent a couple a couple days in South Lake County, Indiana, uh, for a funeral. And I just want to let you guys know, everything is wide open here. 
uh, the stores, the the restaurants, the funeral homes, everything's wide open. There's no masks. There's no signs on the doors. There's no social distancing. It, it, it's like it was like walking into 2019. It was it was wonderful. There's no no uh, uh, panic going on. You know, it appears that we've rounded the corner now. Maybe maybe most maybe a lot of these people that are unvaccinated have already had the virus and maybe we've reached herd immunity or maybe it's because of uh, people haven't started moving inside yet because of the cold weather so uh you know that could be a, a reason for the dip but it, it it all looks and appearances here in indiana is that this thing is over and as it for me it's been over since april when i got vaccinated the only the only re reason i wear a mask anymore now is that the South Shore makes you wear one on the train uh, going to Chicago every day, which is really silly when you think that the restaurants and the stores and everything, you can walk in without a, without a mask, you know, you know, everything else without a mask. So, but that's the, but that's the, the scam is that the Democrats are. It's too bad because masks are supposed to be war. You understand? Right. Mask anyway. Then they do not. Ellen, would, uh, would you let would you let him finish, please? Whoever's talking, shut up. Anyway, uh, so uh, the so anyway, the thing is, uh, Democrats are desperate to keep this pandemic going because this is part of their scam, the mail-in voting scam for the midterm elections. There's some Comes early election the starting. Uh, there's some uh, early election, I believe, starting already. I think maybe in Virginia or something. I don't know. Coming. He might have even already started, you know, with early voting. And uh, so that's why they have to do this because of the fact that there's a lot of little, uh, in, you know, a lot of different states, there's voting regulations that say you don't have to show an ID if it's a hardship. And because of COVID, they're not making them do that. So people can register to vote without an ID and they can vote without an ID and things like that. Now, all this is highlighted. This is it was, uh, I just read. I heard an interview with uh, Molly Hemingway the other night. She just wrote a new book called Rigged, and it was all about the 2020 election. How how the Democrats basically stole it with the via the mail-in balloting, and what they did was, uh, in a nutshell, um, Mark Zuckerberg donated about 400 million dollars to these two. Democratic shell groups that were, you know, posing as election uh, organizations. So he gave them, the, gave them these $400 million. Then these two election organizations then took that money and approached the, all the states and said, hey, we will fund your efforts to, uh, to get this uh, mail-in balloting this year, you know, because of the COVID. And of course, all these states are desperate, you know, for money. They need all the help they can get. Because nobody knew how they were going to pull the election off with the, you know, with COVID and everything. So these these other these organizations says, well, you can we can give you uh, you can hire groups to help you, you know, and we'll pay for it. But they gave the states a list of other groups that were other shell corporate other shell groups. Said you have to choose from these particular groups, and then we'll fund it. So. And of course, all these groups that, that they had to choose from, these were all Democratic favorable groups. And they made sure that they would give a little a little lip service to some, you know, Republican areas and things like that. But most of this was to to have this was what funded the uh, uh, vote harvesting and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And these uh, all these efforts to get. Uh, uh, you know, voting early and voting after the election, you know, two weeks later, ballots still coming in. This was all orchestrated by these these shell groups. And they have all these, uh, just like this, uh, just like our guy, just like Mr. Brady told us tonight, you know, these organizations always have names that sound, you know, real official and plausible, you know, like, the, you know, citizens organizations for fair elections and things like that. Of course, they're getting their money through another group, which is a, just a Democratic shell organization that then gets its money from Mark Zuckerberg. And then they, and then they of course, then concentrate on all the Democratic areas, the swing states of getting out these, uh, these mail-in ballots. 
and in the heaviest counties. But anyway, Molly Hemingway, uh, she outlines all this in her in her new book. I am, I'm looking forward to reading it. And uh, I've so got I, a question for Bob. So I just wanted to mention those things. Yeah, go all ahead, right. Charlie. Yeah, Charlie, go ahead. Bob, you said the pandemic is over in Indiana. What is the, I believe the, the positivity rate has to be at 2% or lower in order to declare it over. What are the positivity rates for the communities in Indiana? You know, I, I haven't checked and my internet service is out. So that's why I'm using my phone right now. Well, then how did you but made, you made a very absolute declaration yeah, that, well, I said, that I have determined the, you didn't, you had no basis whatsoever. No, I said by and all And the rest therapy. of the people in Indiana, which doesn't speak very well for the people from Indiana, you just can't self-declare the pandemic over. I said you by should've. all appearances, by all appearances, it appears to be over since there's no signs on the doors. Yeah, and they, no social distancing. There's no plexiglass. Yeah, all right. but, but, I went to two restaurants. Why do they believe? What factual information do they base their decision, this position on? Assertion is not based on your views, your political opinions of Democrats. Well, go out, go out and, and look at And the second the question opinion. is, I'm sorry, but I was vaccinated and I learned that you should still wear a mask because, and there's a lot of issues about masks, but they said it's so that you don't give COVID to somebody else. Why do you want to give COVID to other people, Bob? Well, the, the statistics I read uh, a couple Why of weeks Why do you ago, want to give COVID to other people when they ask you to? Well, to I, I hope careful. I knew COVID to other people, uh, but uh, uh, Are you, because I know you're a nice guy. Not up to me I'm surprised to, to hear them. you say that. No, you know, it's not my responsibility to protect you. Fuck you. Oh, come not, on. You, you yes, it is. Protect yourself. You can wear 10 masks. You can get three vaccinations, but don't expect you're not me supposed to. to harm other people. Mm -hmm. That's basic ethics. Bob, you're wrong. Can can I, I, can people are supposed anyway. to wear masks all right, all right, because the right. epidemic is no, still no, going on. No, 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 I'm not get, wearing no stupid but, fucking mask. Let me ask this. No, I'm not stupid. Not supposed to be what? Now, I want all you people shut no, the fuck up. Now, um, shut the fuck up. I, I read about a couple of weeks back, I was reading some of these statistics, and I saw that in Indiana that the, the only people that are dying in Indiana are uh, elderly, unvaccinated. Like the average, the median death or mean death was like 79 or something like that for unvaccinated people. Vaccinated people was so low, I, I didn't even get the statistics on the ages, but it was like... You know, it's just a fraction of a fraction of a percent. It was something like, uh, you know, uh, a third of a percent. I mean, not, not you even don't that think much. you or, maintain or, that there's an acceptable death rate? Every yeah, I, yeah, I don't think see any, every yeah, night, don't see, listen, no longer, every night is emergency. important. According uh, to the police, you can't one, kill anybody. Kill driving cars. We're That's not, an acceptable not, death rate. We don't stop people from driving you look, cars. You actually looked up statistics to see, well, only a few people died. Yeah. Come on. I mean, yeah, it's a cost benefit uh, ratio. And just because just because 30,000 people die a year in car accidents, we don't stop every, we don't make everybody park what their cars. What is the expense driving. of wearing a mask? Charlie, you know. I don't okay. like wearing a mask. I find them uncomfortable. I, I'm, you know, they fog up That's my glasses. I don't like of wearing them. I don't like, I don't like wearing them. Could I, I get I, in I, there somehow? I can't, um, I can't breathe. All right. Um, what breathe we're going to do now. I'm learning to breathe free. Okay. Now, before we move on, uh, I'm all, I'm going to probably uh, um, keep going with this stuff, but I do want to say something about fraud. I think the biggest type of fraud that most of us will ever encounter in our lifetimes is that of what happens with internet packages or theft from your porch. And I can tell you right now that, you know, that's just the one type of fraud that affects most people, you know, in the United States, as far as I know, because 
I do nothing but track and trace packages all week long, take care of lost packages, things like this. And, uh, you know, one thing I can tell you is if uh, you, uh, the post office, FedEx and UPS do take fraud very seriously, as well as Amazon and most other internet companies. And if you suspect that you're in a high area of loss for a package, you know, there are two things you can do. One is get a ring doorbell and, you know, get some, you know, get some motion to sensors on it just to protect yourself like a lot of people do. Or two, if you live in a safe area, just know what's coming. Don't go ordering stuff and not know what's coming and then claim loss and find it later on. The biggest and best thing you should always do when you order packages is to get them to a secure address somewhere, whether that be a lockbox or a PO box or if it's your home, make sure you got something that you can go to. Because the one thing I can tell you is this, you know, there are people out there who do steal these things. There are people out there who are what we call professional scammers. They order stuff and they don't, uh, you know, uh, do this stuff. And I'll tell you right now, um, I've caught several people in, in, um, in scams. I think the most creative one I ever saw was when a guy called me up and he said, let's just, it's only a couple hundred bucks. Let's settle this between you and me and the bank and we don't have to get the authorities involved. Well, I called the post office. His son had literally an hour earlier signed for the stuff. So I called the guy up and said, hey, you're claiming loss, but your son just went and got him. And his son was the one who answered the phone and he said, that's my dad scamming again. He says, I've been doing this with the, for, for years. He says, I'm sick and tired of this thing. He took his own dad to court and put him in jail. He was about 68. He put his own dad in jail for six months for fraud. I said, geez, why did you do this? He says, my dad always taught me to be honest and truthful with everybody. But for some reason, he said, when it comes to large companies, he said, they always scam you. They're always going to take advantage of you. And he says, I work for one of those large companies. He says, I do. I have some trust in him. He says, I know there's people out there that will always make mistakes in these large companies. But he said, you know, I just, he says, it's one thing when you have a bad boss and you can report him, but it's quite another when your own dad is contradicting his own advice. Anyway, a couple of tips and pointers when you're ordering online. The first is to always know the name of the company. Do they have a website? Do they have a phone number that you can call? And do and, and how are they going to answer the phone and, and take care of you? Two, if you're dealing with Amazon or, or anything else, is it an Amazon fulfilled by Amazon item? Is it a item that uh, you want from Amazon? And three, is it, uh, is it, is it, or is it an Amazon inspired seller? Know who to call if something goes wrong. Uh, if it's a big retail store, they'll usually have very liberal policies for a lost package for replacement. Smaller companies may be a little bit more, uh, Maybe a little bit more better, but generally you'll find that if you call them up when something's wrong, they'll take care of it. Two is if you really suspect some fraud going on, file a police report. It always helps to uh, call your local law enforcement up and file a police report and say, if you're missing something, take care of it. And three, if you work for one of these organizations, keep a record of addresses of people who've called you in the past. That always helps. I can't tell you how many times I have remembered addresses from previous jobs from previous scammers and a few years later they're calling me up the one story i'd like to tell is there was a guy i used to deliver pizzas to here in algonquin from a for a company called the dante's pizza which is no longer there he always used to complain about his cold food so we'd run him out of replacement pizza well after he did that for four times uh my boss said uh go get the food even if it's half eaten get it from them and then give them their money back and that's exactly what we did. We didn't hear from him again. About five years later, the same guy's calling me up at a new company I work for called UBIT, and he's ordering TVs and all this other stuff from the internet and claiming a lot of stuff is lost. Well, sure enough, I uh, paid him a personal visit. You know, it wasn't supposed to, but I found half of his merchandise sitting in his garage. You know, and it's, it's just, I said, yeah, I'm with you a bit. And I said, you remember me from the pizza store driver? He says, yes. Well, when he called in to you bit to complain about me, I did get a little bit raked over to Coles because uh, it was only there like two weeks at the time. And, uh, you know, he got me on the phone and he said, uh, 
and I, I told him who I was and I delivered pizzas for him and I didn't believe him that he had a lost package. And, you know, a few hours later, I went over to his house and found the TV. But, you know, I did get uh, called into my supervisor's office and he said, Tim, you shouldn't be doing this stuff. Let it, the police handle it from now on. But he said, uh, you know, and then they had to, they, I got a little warning in my personnel file about it. And then he, then after they take it away, he says, good call to him. Uh, I understand, but just tell us next time. Don't, don't, don't introduce it to somebody else. Just tell us on the side. Okay, fine. And when I started this new job about eight years ago, the same address came up, same guy, they cloned him was a lost package, but this time he had died and his son had uh, talked to me and he said, yeah, it's legit this time. He says, this is Tim, huh? Yep. And my dad remembered you from all those years ago. And says, You're still in the business? Yep. But anyway, the one thing I do want to say, though, is that if you suspect package fraud or you suspect any type of internet fraud, you do have three things you can do. First is to call up the vendor and file a police report. Second is if you haven't worked with the vendor, there's usually a, an appeals process in a, FedEx or Amazon or whoever to file a lost package claim. And they usually settle up pretty quickly on stuff like this. And then always use a credit card or a debit card where you can institute the process of chargeback where if the vendor won't refund your money or the police or the UPS and FedEx won't refund your money, you'll always have the official chargeback process with your credit card. And they are very effective at keeping companies honest. I mean, I've seen it before where, you know, we've had a few buyers at my last company, UBIT, who were somewhat uh, questionable on some of the stuff they sent. But the only thing that kept some of those guys in check was the honesty of, their, of the, of the um, chargeback process. And uh, I hate to say it, there is fraud out there, but with a little bit of preventive measures, you too can prevent your, prevent them. So uh, that's all I want to say in the rebuttal, and I hope that. Uh, uh, yeah, but don't don't you think uh, uh, people need to deal with recognizable companies like Amazon, UPS, no. USPS? You know, so the thing at is least, the, you know, you can call them, them they right. call, you know, they, but you not, should, not an recognizable company suspicious. Okay, so I'm saying recognizable companies. companies. Now, if they're listing on eBay and Amazon, there's a, believe it or not, if they're listed on Amazon and eBay, they usually have a process they have to follow for uh, scammers because, you know, I've seen people um, use the chargeback process abusively, you know, where, you know, say the post office is a day late, they'll, they'll get their money back from Amazon. And that's just, you know, that's the other side of the game is that I see a lot of these uh, petty scammers come coming out and making false claims too, as well. I mean, I deal with it every day and, uh, you know, usually a phone call or an email gets something in there, you know, like a guy who will say, I didn't get this. And then we send him a replacement. Then his replacement arrives a week later and he never sends it back and he's got free merchandise. Maybe better to delete it, you know, especially if uh, it's coming we to the spam, to the spam you know. We normally do. But, uh, you know, at the same time, I have um, filed police reports on people across state lines who have had a pattern of doing this, you know, where we get hit twice with the same guy sometimes. He <laughs> didn't know it, but, you know, uh, and they're usually most people are honest. Most people want to do a good job. And I will say when it comes to delivery of packages, um, the best thing to do is, you know, just know that there's still a very high volume out there and that most of these companies are working very hard to get you your stuff and, you know, one of the biggest and most best institutions I know of is the uh, United States Postal Service. They do deliver, but I do remember, too, that there was a lot of priority mail packages taking three and four weeks to go because last Christmas they were uh, taking trucks and, say, for example, in Boston, they were having priority mail truckloads come in and they weren't unloading them for three, four days just because of the sheer volume of packages. The other thing that happened is that... Uh, Many of you may remember that there was a freak snowstorm in Memphis last spring that uh, basically stopped FedEx from <coughs> delivering packages on their overnight and two-day delivery score when they had snow in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, and they only had like two plows and they had like 20 inches of snow there. And actually what they were doing was they were taking uh, 
uh, their their overnight packages and running them down to ground. And uh, it was taking like sometimes two, three, four weeks to get it in. And I don't know what's happened. The mail too. I remember mailing a whole bunch of packages out the week after Thanksgiving, and customers weren't getting them till the end of January. So but don't you again, think? Don't you think? Uh, you know, like people who they hiring this company, they need to well, cheer, you know a lot they of these guys. Them, you know. Right? A lot of these people are having trouble hiring because, you know, there are long hours, a lot of packages in there. FedEx is hiring right now. Post office is hiring right now. And they're just having trouble keeping, uh, you know, keeping workers because of the workload and everything like that. And uh, hey, you know, Sam, I, you, I heard a, I was listening to a podcast today. I heard a, an ad from Amazon. They're hiring drivers, $3,000 signing bonus yep. 20, and $22 an hour. That's correct. But the thing is, when you go into those things, I also expect you to work 10, 12 hours a day. That's yes. not, that's, that's, that's not bad. And, uh, you know, a lot of those times too, you know, those, uh, you know, Amazon doesn't retain people that long. They usually quit after about a year because of the, they do have a lot of uh, 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 conditions that they place in the workers. Maybe it's for, it's for the first time in my life, I'm seeing with this worker empowerment, um, a lot less worker abuse because people are trying to hire and get good workers in rather than, uh, you know, it's just, I got to do my best to keep Mr. Corporation going. Um, it's I'm, not I, a perfect I, study, but I've I'm been just, listening to Teamsters for years mm -hmm. and I've never met one who said it was an easy job. No, I know they, it's they, not an They easy really job. demand that you hustle. Yes, that's true. A you really got to hustle. Yes, and I know. believe you, it causes problems among the the employees because they set standard. They that's what they did to Teamster Joe. They gave him work assigned workloads that I'll were right. impossible. I'll be right back. Them. I'm just gonna hit the washroom. I'll be right back. Well, just go. Okay. But they gave right. Teamster Joe. They wanted to fire him. All right. Since so, this. All right. Can I talk? Yes, Charlie, please. Thank you. They they wanted to fire Teamster Joe because he was causing issues. So they gave him impossible uh, assignments. And he beat them at it. He finished each of them. That, in fact, happened to me once in my career. The manager thought uh, uh, they'd take care of me. So they gave me a workload that was incredible. And what happened was everybody in the office helped me complete the assignment. So I got it done on time and done perfectly with this system. Word got around, I said, and, he, and they, hated, they hated this manager. So <laughs> then they issued a rule that if I was given any more work, this is amazing. I was supposed to do it myself, which I don't know if that was, that was never challenged, but mm -hmm. <laughs> if coworkers voluntarily wanted to help me out then, and it didn't interfere with their jobs, what's the issue? Um, I might add regarding, since I got the microphone, this employee mandates, I've been involved in negotiations nationwide on this issue. The yeah, case I'm law, the case law was finished. finalized some time ago on this. Charlie, the employers, let, let me finish. finish, please. The uh, employer uh, has an obligation to provide a safe workplace. Now, a number of the individuals who claim medical freedom don't realize, like people like me, we also run for exempt to vaccinated people. And we have figures that at least 50% of the people or more do not want to work with unvaccinated people. So we're trying to balance it. Uh, the case law is such that a private employer as fully a lawful, we can mandate that you be vaccinated by a certain date. Otherwise, they can terminate you. Well, they can terminate you as it is. In a union operation, it's a different matter.
but and the only basis you can appeal it is on religious or uh, if you have some pre-existing condition that precludes you from getting vaccinated. Now that's where it stands. The reason employers are doing it, two more things. They are liable to lawsuits. Should anybody in their employment get COVID or bring it home? Charlie, so can I ask you a question? Line, I'm almost finished. So they can they can be sued by any employees at, right now um, regarding that. So you only have very Charlie, can I ask appeal. you a question? Hold on, Ellen. Hold yeah, on, please. Ahead. I haven't asked one, okay? So what if this is not a vaccine, it's actually a poison? Who what what would you say if that was true? Whatever the <laughs> employer mandates. He can mandate the vaccine. Let everybody That's get poisoned. It's a case law. It's a he done be deal. Sued. It's been settled. Yeah, it's not I'm a vaccine. Not it's it's, it's poison. Been, it's yeah, no I'm agreeing on what you said. And now here's the other side of the coin is because all side the effect will be later. You never know. And the but legal departments effect. of of the big employers nationwide. What if this is poison, Charlie? Let me what? Finish. Do you have a conscience? The employers what? Are you for poison? The big employers it's nothing to do with employers, Charlie. It. Right. Charlie, it's nothing to it's do with employer. Deal. You understand that nothing, nothing to do with employer. Because you know absolutely Ellen may be right. Because it needs to be so much precaution. And you know, you never know what side effect could be after a week or after this a couple thing hours. Gets into the brain. I'd like to ask Doug knows. Doug exactly. Finkley was right. there when the when a microbiologist from Great Lakes Naval Station who approved Fauci's Fauci's vaccine well, from the again. 90s, God, he said he he's like, I'm not allowed to tell you whether I would take it or not, but I'm worried about the S protein, the spike sticking to the cells and gathering in the lymph nodes. And that's a, that's a microbiologist. He went there, he said, nurses don't know. Nurses, not not even the smartest nurses, no, because they're not taught this. They're, but okay. but a microbiologist who approves the Fauci because he works for the government. He's a lieutenant governor, and because of that, nuts. he's not allowed to tell you the truth, yeah. Charlie. Right? Yeah. And it's poison, and it kills. Yeah. He's not allowed to tell you because he works for the government. You. And All right, lawyers have mandated, and, and it's if a we done deal. You, we can't tell you the truth. So you can we argue this if you want. It's not going anywhere. Could you tell it? It's not going anywhere. Okay, we 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 settled it. It's it's it kills you. That vaccine will kill you, and what their family part of it, with it. What okay? part of it? Good luck. Have court. fun. Yes, some terrible side effects. Terrible side effects. It's okay, terrible now, way. before, before uh, like I said, I'm I not... think the vaccines work myself. No, no, uh, you know, well, maybe. Well, anyway, very then, let, let's leave this again. And some because... people work for some people, right. you know, very controversial. Okay, and it's now. Going to be extremely voluntarily. And right, only any, one in court. Is there anybody else who's got any comments before I uh, close down the session? formally tonight we can stay on online and yeah it, i i want to i want to say something um ellen it breaks my heart that you've become an anti-vaxxer i'm not uh, all anti-vax i'm anti-poison geoengineering sure. bio-warfare the, the, the vaccine's Killer. not a poison dog? yeah I had, you know, dog? I had my two doses i'm gonna oh, get my booster you very soon you don't know what's exactly. gonna i had no side you. effects I'm sorry whatsoever. you don't know you know, it breaks my you. heart that you and every other liberal is so misinformed. And you were there that night that that man I'm hardly about misinformed. It. I'll I, ask him about it. I, I don't know what this thing about Dr. I'm sorry Fauci that you're talking gonna about. Die, but Doug. I'm Dr. Really Fauci sorry. has That's a very good reputation say. as a doctor and a microbiologist. And he well, was Ellen, involved I, I, I with think. some things in the early days uh, of his earlier days he of his career and i don't have time to go back into that ancient did, history i, I don't did really you see what the him, point I is asked him, did you take you, the vaccine you got some goes, nitpick about you. and dr They're fauci had nothing to do with, with developing the current control. vaccines he didn't he didn't work on them he didn't yes uh, he did uh, 
the, he the Moderna microbiology. The Moderna is a the Moderna and Pfizer are completely new processes that didn't. They are not. Exist They're lying about it. They've been, they came recently, out in 2000. On, Ellen, on I the, wish you'd take a scale look at that. They were ideas. They were used in the flu shot in 2016. They're lying like about years. everything. <laughs> this whole all thing right, is a big lie. Dr. Fauci like wasn't big all right, guys, this is a major player in developing these vaccines. Okay, guys. So you guys, what does he I'm have to do with it? What does he have to do with that? Open your mind to the big lies. The data shows that they're safe and okay. effective. We all have and Ellen. The data shows they're safe about. and effective. I gotta go. Bye. Bye. I, it breaks my heart, Bye. Ellen. That you're, you've gone down the rabbit hole. Well, I, the thing I can't, is, I can't listen to the screaming every week that well, I, Ellen I, I, does. I, I it that. is not helping her case. Not at all. Well, I hope it, you know, I'd like her to present, but the one thing I would like her to do is get a damn good speech going. I mean, it's one thing just because the last time she's presented, it was just a lot of blather and, and whatnot. If she yeah, can get organized, yeah. I mean, our there's, guy there's next not week, a lot of consistency there. Yeah. But the thing is, I, our guy next week was going to be anti vax and all this stuff, so at least going to give us a good presentation as to why. I think he's totally yeah. nuts, but uh, it'll be interesting to learn from him a little bit. I appreciate that wants an audience, but if she could perhaps get her thoughts down on paper, write letters to the editor, do yeah. anything but come here and scream. Well, that's the thing. I think she's, uh, we got to get Andy Anderson back. Because here. people concerned what's exactly well, inside of those vaccines. We got to well, get live you know, again soon here. We'll but be I very concerned. A little while. Very concerned right. because nobody knows side effects. Well, which could be later <laughs> and affect your brain and uh, DNA, right. you know, and you never I wish, know the type I wish of wish you guys would read a book. I just finished <laughs> one by uh, Dr. Uh, Margaret, are you familiar with that, the Dr. Doudna and gene therapy? Uh, she wrote, I'm going to share a link to the book in a minute on screen, if you guys don't mind. Is but she anyway, with CRISPR? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. The CRISPR process? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Anyway, as of right now, I'm going to formally... Uh, say good night to the session at this point so well thank you everybody for participating it's too bad our speaker left and uh too bad we had to go down a rabbit hole but chuck you want to say something before we terminate all right so then I'll, I'll officially stop the recording and uh thank you for all for attending tonight as i said i'll keep the zoom call open